Good morning and welcome to today's oversight hearing on African American studies and the hiring of black faculty at the City University of New York. I'm Council Member Inez Barron, Chair of the Committee on Higher Education and a proud CUNY alum. First, I want to acknowledge that it has been more than four years since the committee last conducted a hearing on faculty diversity at CUNY. During that hearing, we recognized that while CUNY's undergraduate student body more or less reflected the diversity of New York City, its faculty and leadership do not. This lack of diversity is even more profound at the top governance of the university, including the chancellor and college president levels. Unfortunately, since that hearing, there has been a growing resentment of diversity in this country to the point where black Americans had to stand up and continue to do so to remind everyone that black lives matter. And that resentment was even more proliferated, proliferated at our government federal level. We all remember when Donald Trump unapologetically claimed that both sides were blamed for the violence in white supremacist rallies. But I want to remind you and indeed celebrate with you that New York is one of the most culturally diverse cities in the country and along with many of its great institutions, such as CUNY, New York City is the greatest city in the world, not in spite of its diversity, but because of it. As such, CUNY was established with explicit legislative findings that recognized an imperative need for affirmative action and that its personnel should, quote, reflect the diverse communities which comprise the people of the city and state of New York. Moreover, the intent of these findings, quote, should be evident in all the guidelines established by the Board of Trustees, end quote, including specifically hiring. According to the U.S. Census, there are more than a third of New York City population that was born outside of the United States. Nearly a quarter identify as black and nearly a third as Hispanic. Just under 15 percent is Asian Pacific Islander. This diversity continues to be reflected across CUNY's undergraduate institutions where over a quarter of its students are black, one third Hispanic, and more than a fifth Asian Pacific Islanders. But there exist troubling inequities as we look deeper into the representation of black people across the university. Although there is an abundance of research touting the importance of, culturally, of cultural diversity, especially in an educational setting, one does not need to cite sources to realize that racial diversity benefits everyone. In a post Brown versus Board of Education in the United States, we know that diversity expands worldliness, enhances social development, prepares students for work in a global society as well as future career success, increases our knowledge base, promotes creative thinking, enhances self-awareness, and enriches multiple perspectives. This is also true of the importance of African American studies in our schools. Black Americans deserve to have their role in civilization, history, literature, politics, and society honored and celebrated. There are currently more than 900,000 black undergraduates enrolled at public colleges and universities across the country. For every full-time black faculty member at a public college or university, there are 42 full-time degree-seeking black students. Again, that ratio for every full-time black faculty member at a public college or university there are 42 full-time degree-seeking black undergraduates. So of the 1,691 institutions across the country, 40 of those institutions employ no full-time black instructors. And on 44% of public campuses, there are 10 or fewer full-time black faculty members across all ranks and academic fields. In a report published by the U University of Southern California on black students at public colleges and universities published this month, certain CUNY schools ranked favorably in four equity indicators with regard to black students and faculty, while others failed miserably. 
It is therefore crucial that CUNY make a concerted effort with measurable outcomes to increase diversity among members of both the administration and faculty and increase and uplift black administrators and faculty in particular. There are few state and federal policymakers that identify as black. This in part attributes to a raceless approach in policymaking that fails to level the playing field for black Americans. Of course, policymakers across all racial and ethnic groups, as well as the largely white college presidents, trustees, senior administrators, professors, and admissions office across the US are responsible for guaranteeing that public sec post-secondary institutions equitably serve the public, including black constituencies. As a black member, as a black member of the New York City Council and as chair of the Committee on Higher Education, I am committed to fighting for educational equities and ensuring that CUNY better serves black students. This does not happen in a vacuum. Post-secondary institutions need not only improve representation equity in student enrollment, but also gender and degree completion. It also requires a comprehensive approach to improving the black student to black faculty ratio, which may include an obligation to address the racial climate and potential workload imbalance issues and ensure that non-black faculty and administrators respect their scholarship. I know that CUNY has a number of programs and initiatives to increase diversity among its student population and in the recruitment of faculty and administrators, and I'm looking forward to learning about their outcomes, but there remain racial inequities from campus to campus among students, faculty, and administrators, and among university leadership. I want to acknowledge my colleagues on the Higher Education Committee who are present. We have Council Member Holden, and we have Majority Leader Lori Cumbo. I would also like to thank uh, my staff, Chloe Rivera, the committee's policy analyst, uh, Paul Senegal, the counsel to the committee, Yari Shavit, the, the committee's new finance analyst, Joy Simmons, my chief of staff, my CUNY liaison, uh, Indigo Washington, Director of Legislation. And now at this time, I'm gonna have the first panel called and then the council will administer the oath. We're going to have a panel consisting of Vita Rabinowitz, the interim chancellor, Jose Luis Cruz, president of, Bronx, of Lehman College in the Bronx, and Claudia Schrader, president of Brooklyn College, uh, no, President Kingsborough Community College in Brooklyn. You can have a seat. And the council will administer the oath. Good morning. Would you raise your right hands? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Please state your names for the record. Thank you. Uh, we welcome you, especially our new president, just uh, assigned, and we're so glad that you're here and we're ready for your testimony. of the City Council. My name is Vita Rabinowitz. I am Interim Chancellor of the City University of New York. I am delighted to join you today along with my esteemed colleagues, Jose Luis Cruz, President of Lehman College, and Claudia Schrader, President of Kingsborough Community College, as of 12 days ago. I appreciate the opportunity for us to testify before you, and thank you, as always, for your steadfast support of CUNY our students and faculty. I am here today to speak about faculty diversity generally with a particular focus on the hiring of black faculty. 
You have also asked about the state of black or African American studies at CUNY, and I will be addressing that as well. CUNY, as you know, is a majority minority system and arguably the most diverse university in the United States, if not the world. We pride ourselves on reflecting the extraordinary diversity of the city we serve. We exemplify our commitment to access, diversity, inclusion, and equity in so many places, in our student enrollments, in our leadership, in the many programs the university and its colleges run to recruit and support diverse populations, in our scholarly work in the public interest, in our welcoming and accommodating campus climates, and in the extensive services that CUNY offers to, the New, York, to New York City and the community. Our approach to the hiring, retention, and advancement of faculty of color is a key example of this commitment and has been a particular focus of mine over the past three years in, in my former position as university provost. Hiring faculty of color is deeply rooted in our mission of academic excellence and opportunity for all. We simply cannot be the university we aspire to be without a diverse faculty and staff. The quality of the education we offer our students and our contribution to academic knowledge depends on having a wide range of backgrounds, experiences, and perspectives in our faculty and leadership. In addition, we know from research and deeply believe that the composition of our faculty matters to student success. For our minority students, seeing people who look like them and share their backgrounds engages and inspires them. It reinforces our essential mission. CUNY was built for them. They are welcome here. They can thrive here. For all students, regardless of ethnicity, exposure to a diverse set of great thinkers and leaders prepares them to thrive and lead in an increasingly globalized world. For any of our students who want to be professors themselves, they have come to the right place if they come to CUNY. Let me start with some basic facts to ground today's discussion. In recent years, both the number and share of our total faculty who are members of federally protected minority groups comprised of American Indian, Native Alaskan, Asian, Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Black, African American, Hispanic, Latino, or two or more races has been growing. Between fall 2010 and fall 2017, the share of full-time minority faculty encompassing all those groups has grown from 32.3% to 35.9%. And the total number has grown from 2,369 to 2,746. In the same period, full-time black or African-American faculty grew very slightly from 933 to 944. And the share of the total percentage of black faculty is essentially flat at about 12.3%. It's important to note that there is wide variation in the share of faculty who are minority across CUNY campuses and across academic disciplines. In terms of executive positions on campus and in the central office, in the fall of 19, excuse me, of 2017, 35% were underrepresented minorities with 17% black or African American. Again, there is a wide range across CUNY institutions. So what have we been doing to address these issues? In order to advance diversity among faculty and staff, we have had to work on several fronts simultaneously. First, we have to bring in more diverse new hires, and second, we have to work to retain and advance the minority faculty and staff we have. 
We are doing both of these things and beginning to see results, but we have much more to do. Making a difference in both the hiring and retention of faculty starts with leadership. In recent years, CUNY has greatly increased the share of black, Hispanic, and female leaders among its college presidents, placing a diverse group of eminently qualified individuals in these highly visible positions. Across CUNY's 18 undergraduate colleges, the on the presidential level, half of CUNY presidential leadership are black and Hispanic, and seven of the 18 CUNY presidents are now women. In terms of new faculty hiring, we have started to see higher rates of black and minority hiring recently. In 2016-2017, 44% of all new full-time faculty hires at CUNY were members of federally protected minority groups, up from 30% in 2013 2014. 50 of these new hires in 2016, 2017, 50 of these or 15.1% were black faculty. In the past academic year, 2017, 2018, at the recommendation of a faculty diversity working group co-chaired by Presidents Jose Luis Cruz, who is here today, and, pre, uh, and the President of Brooklyn College, Michelle Anderson, Chancellor Milliken and I asked campuses to step up training, technical support, and the monitoring of faculty searches in departments where data showed us that the, that the share of minority faculty falls below benchmarks of labor market availability. This is the place where we have the most need and the most opportunity to make a difference. The goal was and is to create a greater degree of transparency, innovation, and accountability for faculty diversity in these searches. While this work has just begun, again, the committee began its work last academic year we have seen departments adopt innovative and research-based practices like expanded outreach to a wider array of professional organizations, early intensive engagement with historically black colleges and, and universities, the use of conferences to identify promising minority candidates and invite them to present their work on our campuses. We have early data from last year's efforts which tracked a subset of total new hiring, uh, 110 completed searches in areas where there was, excuse the term colleagues, but it is the official term, underutilization, which means the share of minority faculty falls below the benchmarks of um, labor market availability. So 110 completed searches in areas of underutilization. 51.6% of the hires from these searches were from federally protected minority groups, and they include 14 black faculty. We are continuing this intensive support this year, and we are still working on completing the uncompleted searches. So these are, um, these are preliminary data. Um, CUNY's graduate students at the Graduate Center and its other graduate and professional schools are the most diverse doctoral students nationwide. And these students allow us to cultivate a robust and diverse pipeline of future faculty members. Now, hiring more minority faculty will not by itself accomplish our diversity objectives if we do not do more to retain and advance the diverse faculty we already have. Our important work in retention 
and advancement of minority faculty has been deeply informed by the COACH survey of faculty satisfaction. This tool, developed by the Harvard Graduate School of Education and last administered in 2015, showed us that CUNY faculty of color in particular yearned for more opportunities for promotion and advancement and senior leadership and more departmental collegiality. We have begun addressing these concerns through a range of initiatives, including diversity and inclusion conferences, implicit bias training, faculty publication programs, and a diversity projects development fund. Here too, the Faculty Diversity Working Group has made recommendations and we are implementing new initiatives. Let me describe a few. In fall 2017, Chancellor Milliken and I established the Chancellor's Opportunity Fund that promotes strategic recruitment and retention efforts across the disciplines with a significant financial investment. That fund continues to this day and to date has made 10 awards. Of those 10 awards, three were used to successfully retain black faculty who had offers to go elsewhere. The CUNY Mellon Faculty Diversity Career Enhancement Initiative develops sustained me uh, mentorship for junior faculty with an emphasis on uh, faculty from underrepresented groups using reading research writing seminars, a series of professionalization workshops and the like. Currently, this initiative works with Queens, Hunter, Brooklyn, and City Colleges, the four Mellon Mays undergraduate fellow serving institutions at CUNY. A new program in, in its second year is the Mid-Career Faculty Fellowship Program. This addresses CUNY's goal of retaining and advancing a diverse faculty by providing support and resources to help tenured assistant and associate professors advance. This, uh, we find that many faculty of color and women languish at the associate professor level. So we have instituted a program that provides mentorship and professional developments of uh, uh, professional development of the 21 participants this last year, 16 were from underrepresented groups and seven of those, fully one third of the group, were black faculty. I am especially excited to tell you about diversifying CUNY's leadership, a CUNY Harvard consortium among CUNY, Harvard Graduate School of Education and the Harvard Club of New York Foundation. This is a brand new program that aims to cultivate a diverse group of future CUNY leaders by providing best in class professional development for faculty and staff interested in leadership opportunities at CUNY. When we got this grant a year and a half ago, there was tremendous excitement across the university. 72 faculty and staff across CUNY applied to participate and eight were selected along with President Claudia Schrader, who you'll hear from soon, and who is participating as a mentor to the cohort. Of the nine leaders who were selected in a competitive process, five are black and one leader identifies as black and Latino. The program launched this past summer. We sent nine leaders to the Harvard Institutes free of charge and the program components include training um, and additional mentorship and development opportunities. I learned last week that the Harvard Foundation has committed to another round of funding next year, um, which is very uh, gratifying. President Schrader, our newest president, a transformative leader committed to diversity and a black woman who has risen through the ranks at Medgar Evers College, at Bronx Community College, and now leads Kingsborough Community College, will share more about her experience in the Harvard um, CUNY program and uh, her role as a mentor to the cohort later today. Turning now to the topic of black and African American programs at CUNY, I want to state that these are important interdisciplinary areas of study at the university. 
allowing students to examine the history, sociology, sociology, culture, science, and technology, and more through the critical lens of racial equity in our country and beyond. CUNY has long been committed to this kind of learning. Five CUNY senior colleges offer majors and degree programs in black or African American studies. These are Brooklyn, City, CSI, Hunter, and Lehman Colleges. The Graduate Center offers an advanced certificate in Africana Studies to currently matriculated doctoral students. Additionally, Baruch, John Jay, and New York City Tech have a Black, Africana, and African American Studies Department, respectively, offering a range of coursework and minors, but not a major or degree program. Enrollment and degrees granted by these programs is growing modestly across the university between fall 2013 and fall 2017. Enrollment in majors grew from 165 to 193 degrees granted in black or Africana studies. Generally is up from uh, 58 to 65 in that same um, time period. The largest programs are at City, Hunter, and Lehman Colleges. Many more students are taking courses offered by these departments than five years ago. So enrollment in courses is sharply rising. By fall 2017, 6,159 students were enrolled in courses in black or Africana studies, up from 5,223 in fall 2013. That's an increase of 18%. Let me quickly describe uh, two examples um, of our Africana studies departments or programs. Brooklyn College's Africana studies department is one of the oldest in the nation founded more than 40 years ago with support from the Ford Foundation. Given the department's solid reputation and the breadth of its offerings covering the black diaspora of the African, African American, and African Caribbean studies exper uh, experiences, student enrollment has re remained robust at Brooklyn. The department engages in interdisciplinary collaboration by supporting the Shirley Chisholm Project on uh, Brooklyn Women's Activism and the Caribbean Studies Program and Women's Studies Programs. Brooklyn's Africana Studies Programs cross lists 40% of its courses with other departments. Second, City Tech's Department of African American Studies offers a broader way of academic coursework and cultural activities related to the African diaspora. Even though City Tech does not offer a major, the department has seven full-time faculty and soon will be celebrating its 50th anniversary. Each semester, a thousand students enroll in more than 30 classes that cover the history, politics, literature, and arts of the peoples of the African diaspora. Um, CUNY values diversity and is committed to diversifying the ranks of its faculty. It's also committed to supporting robust, meaningful black studies programming. Even as perhaps the most racially and ethnically diverse university in the world, CUNY's commitment to colleges that are inclusive and diverse at their highest levels and throughout the faculty ranks has never been more central to its mission. Chair Barron, I want to make it clear that while we are investing and while we are making new investments and making progress, we know we are by no means where we want to be and where we need to be on this. We also know that progress is uneven among our colleges and within disciplines and departments. Continued progress requires strong leadership from the top. It requires strategic investments and it requires constant vigilance. Our Board of Trustees, led by Chairman Bill Thompson, is itself the most diverse board in CUNY's history, and the board has made faculty and leadership diversity a priority. So have I, and so will anyone CUNY chooses as its permanent chancellor. In fact, 
we have announced that CUNY will appoint its first Vice Chancellor for Diversity and Inclusion to be selected by and reporting to the new Chancellor directly. Meanwhile, I am pleased to tell you that there is evidence of a deeper cultural change throughout the university. Our presidents and senior leaders in the central office and throughout the colleges are committed to this work and to moving the needle on faculty and leadership diversity. They're starting their own innovative programs, not just to meet targets, but because they feel the moral, societal, and academic imperative to better serve our students. It is now my pleasure to invite President Jose Luis Cruz of Lehman College to testify about the work of the Chancellor's Faculty Diversity Working Group and his efforts at Lehman College to address faculty diversity. Thank you, Chancellor. Chair Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you on the important issues of faculty diversity and African American studies programs. My name is Jose Luis Cruz and I have the privilege of serving as president of Lehman College of the City University of New York, the only CUNY senior college in the proud resilient borough of the Bronx. And in the past year, as Chancellor Rabinovitz indicated, I've had the honor of serving as co-chair of the university's faculty diversity working group. Based on my own personal experience, both as a former faculty member and longtime academic administrator, and the deep discussions with members of the working group, which includes eight other campus presidents, two vice chancellors, and a university dean, it is clear to me that the hard, important work of building a diverse faculty is as much about the implementation of best practices as it is about empowering better practitioners. Practitioners who can not only design, develop, and implement effective search processes that yield highly qualified hires from a diversity of backgrounds, but who are also able to nurture and support them through the reappointment, tenure, and promotion process by sustaining a highly inclusive campus climate. Lehman College, a designated Hispanic-serving institution with more than 14,000 students in 170-plus undergraduate and graduate programs, is an excellent example of how institutions can accelerate progress through these types of intentional efforts. As a top-ranked vehicle of upward minority mobility among our nation's minority-serving institutions, and with a student body that represents 131 countries, creating a truly diverse, inclusive campus is imperative at Lehman. Indeed, eight and a half years ago, my predecessor, Dr. Ricardo Fernandez, came before this committee. In his testimony, he painted a picture of a college deeply committed to the university's affirmative action, equal opportunity, and diversity policies because of the campus community's strong belief that, and I quote, a diverse workforce enriches the intellectual discussions, promotes cultural competency, and strengthens our ability to prepare our students to live and work in a global society. At the time, President Fernandez reported that in the previous five years, total full-time minority faculty had grown from 23.4% to 26.9%. But more importantly, he foreshadowed that significant gains would be made in the ensuing decade in support of the college's 2009 through 2019 strategic plan which included diversity as a core institutional value. Today, I am pleased to report that on issues of faculty diversity, Lehman is trending upward and moving forward. As of last week, the Department of Human Resources reports that Lehman employed 377 full-time faculty, of which 37% are faculty of color. This represents an increase of 10 percentage points in the proportion of full-time faculty of color a gain made more impressive by the fact that full-time faculty employment has decreased from a total of 384 to 377 since President Fernandez's testimony. The diversity gains registered in recent years at Lehman are perhaps best illustrated by a breakdown of Lehman's full-time faculty by rank. While faculty of color currently represent 0% of the college's distinguished professors and only 18% of the full professors, they represent 35% of associate professors, 47% of assistant professors, and 50% of lecturers. This profile is significant because it suggests that if in addition to perfecting our college's recruitment and hiring practices, we are able to retain our current faculty of color and help them progress through the academic ranks, 
the increase in the percentage of full-time faculty of color that we will register in the next five years as we enter the second half of Lehman's first century will be even of more impressive proportion than it has been to date. Turning now to our academic programs. As an institution with deep roots in the liberal arts, Lehman works hard day in and day out to live up to the ideal articulated, articulated upon our founding 50 years ago of enriching the human spirit and offering to as many as can realize their potential the opportunity to be so enriched. Lehman's Department of African Studies is one important vehicle for advancing this ideal. The department offers a 36 credit major and a 15 credit minor. It employs six full-time faculty, has an additional full-time faculty through a joint appointment with Latino studies and 10 adjuncts, and is recruiting for another full-time faculty as we speak. As of fall 2017, there were 47 majors and 30 minors. A total of 50 majors obtained their degrees this past summer. That's almost twice as many majors in Africana studies that obtained a degree just three years ago. But these numbers do not tell the entire story. As the department reaches many students at the college beyond majors and minors, courses from the department are well represented in the Pathways General Education Curriculum that all students must complete. At Lehman, courses from Africana Studies Department comprise a significant number of courses in the world cultures and global issues and creative expression distribution areas. Faculty from the department also teach course sections of our upper division college option requirement. Nearly 1,200 students were impacted through these courses this past academic year. That's 10% of our overall student body. Indeed, ethnic studies programs across the country have a long history of fueling multi-generational transformational change. And, it, and this is true both at the personal and societal level. As a story you will soon hear of the ascension of my colleague, Dr. Claudia Schrader, to the presidency of Kingsborough Community College so vividly illustrates. In closing, I want to state that in my two plus years at Lehman, both in my role as president and co-chair of the university's faculty diversity working group, I can attest to the commitment of every campus in the system to recruiting and retaining a world-class faculty that reflects the rich diversity of our student body and to building and maintaining robust ethnic studies programs that further our university's commitment to inclusive excellence. We know we can and must do better, and we are doing the hard work that this requires. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Sears. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce President Claudia Schrader to the pledge of the flag. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Barron and members of the Higher Education Committee of the City Council. I'm humbled to provide this testimony to you today on African American departments and programs and the hiring of black faculty at the City University of New York. This is a topic that's deeply personal to me. When I entered Rutgers University in 1986 as an eager freshman, I just knew I would major in journalism. But my major in journalism was not all what I thought it would be. As the only black student in many of my classes, I would raise my hand only to be ignored. When I was acknowledged, my contributions were dismissed in favor of other students whose contributions were often a carbon copy of my own. Most importantly, there was little or no opportunity for me to do what I loved to do in the first place, which was write. Disillusioned, I sought refuge in the arms of the Department of African Studies, and my world opened up. I audited courses by Ivan Van Sertema and Amiri Baraka. I went to lectures by Kwame Torre and Angela Davis. I fell in love with the great works of Zora Neale Hurston, James Baldwin, and Richard Wright. I fell in love with the critical and creative writing that I was finally able to do. And I fell in love with learning about the African diaspora, my people, and our inextricable link and impact on the world. And most importantly, in a world that often determines what beauty is and isn't, I fell in love with myself as a black woman, and for the first time, I felt that I can do anything I set my mind to. My Africana Studies major provided me with fertile ground from which I grew as a professional. It was, it was my papers on the link between young black men being placed in special education and their incarceration rates that sparked my interest in special education and my subsequent graduate work at Teachers College in Special Ed. Africana Studies was a fertile ground which I sold through my work as a home-based developmental specialist in Brownsville, East New York, and other underserved areas 
in Brooklyn helping to support the development of infants with developmental delay delays and thwart their fall into special education and the prison pipeline. Africana Studies was the fertile ground which nurtured my completion of a doctorate in international and transcultural studies and my first full-time position as a faculty member at Megar Evers College in the teacher education department. I cut my teeth at Megar and the rest, as we would say, is history. I advanced through the administrative ranks to associate provost and then provost at Bronx Community College where I spent the last five years and where during my tenure I attended to the hiring, retention, and success of faculty of color and closing the achievement gap for black and Hispanic students and the success of all students. I am now proud to continue this work at Kingsborough Community College where I serve as the institution's first black president. From where I stand, the university has made marked progress in forwarding the agenda of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I know that there's much work to be done, not only to recruit and hire faculty of color, but to retain them on campuses and in climates that are conducive to their growth and success. The university recognizes this, as do I. As provost at BCC, I worked to ensure that our faculty reflected our student body and were part of all academic departments. I encourage faculty and staff to avail themselves of opportunities created by the CUNY Office of Recruitment and Diversity, such as funding for research, support for scholarly writing, and the development of programs that advance diversity and improve campus climates. When data generated by the Collaborative on Academic Careers in Higher Education, the CODE survey, revealed that our women and faculty of color took, women and faculty of color did not feel adequately supported towards being promoted and receiving tenure, BCC took decisive action. We revised relevant materials to ensure criteria were clear and consistent and information was accessible and developed workshops to provide support to faculty preparing for promotion at each level and tenure. The university's commitment to the professional development of faculty of color is further demonstrated in the development of the CUNY Harvard Consortium Leadership Program. I was fortunate to be sponsored by the university to participate in the Harvard Institute for Educational Management, but I'm even more excited to serve as a mentor to the consortium's first cohort, a dynamic group of eight faculty and staff of color, which include two black men and three, two black women and three black men, who I'm confident will be CUNY's next generation of leaders. In closing, there's an African proverb that says, we bequest two things to our children. One is roots and the other is wings. I'm confident in living proof that programs in black studies will provide the same for students who choose to embrace it as I did. A solid li liberal arts foundation, deep roots of personal fulfillment, respect for others, and the wings to make a difference. Thank you. I wanna thank the panel for your testimony, and we're going to jump right into questions. And uh, the chancellor has indicated that she has another pressing engagement, so I'm going to go straight to the heart of the matter. Thank you so much again for your testimony. And while you indicate the numbers of black faculty have increased, bottom line is it's flat. Correct. So we have leadership, the CUNY leadership at the graduate level does not reflect at all any new hires that are black, getting a lot of feedback here, uh, any new hires that are black. We know that as persons are hired by departments, that the old boy network, I'm getting some feedback, if you can check the system. Thank you. We know that the old boy network is the one that's responsible for bringing in new faculty. As I looked at the new hires, you have a report which talks about the quarterly report on faculty diversity published January 2018 with data from July 2016 through June 2017. Of the new hires at the professorial level, 53% were white. At the, lec at the lecturers, lecturers and instructional level, um, that represented 47 new white hires as opposed to seven new black hires. When we look at the senior colleges, 57% of the new hires were white, with 94 
new hires at the professorial level, and only 29 black. At the lecturer's level and instructor's level, at the senior colleges, 37 were white and only three were black. At the community colleges, 44% of the new hires represented those who were white, being 29 positions as opposed to 14 for blacks. When we look at the new hires at particular schools, some of the highest were 60% uh, at uh, City College who were white, 83% at the School of Medicine, 69% uh, at Hunter, 64% white hires at Lehman, 57% uh, at Queens, and these were the levels of professorial re level as well as lecturers and instructors. So part of the reason I think that it's flat is because we continue, we can't just look at the absolute numbers and talk about increases. How does that fit in the totality? And when it stays flat, we can't pat ourselves on the back to say we're hiring more people. Chair Barron, if I, if I may, um, one of the, uh, there, there are issues in hiring, and we know that. We also have retention issues that I want to tur tur turn to in a minute because we know that faculty of color, including black faculty, leave CUNY at higher rates than white faculty do. But on the matter of um, faculty hiring, uh, one of the analyses we want to uh, do is the number of offers made to black faculty that are um, that are not accepted because faculty have better offers anywhere. In other words, we're looking to get behind the reason we're not moving the needle. Last year, we had a better year than the than the statistics that you've read. In the most recent um, uh, uh, round, it appears that 50, a little more than 15% of new hires were black. But those are our latest, very latest statistics. Up until 2017, those numbers, I can't verify those numbers because I don't have them in front of me, but they sound about right. It's well, according to this report, as I've read it, it's 12% of new hires that are black, full-time, I'm talking about right, full-time, right, right. that are black. And that's, that's about, yes. Okay, that's, that's a problem. Yes. And you talked about half of the 18 undergraduate uh, presidents. presidents are black. Or, his, or Latino. Black yes. or Latino, or, yes. yes. I think it, it was four and four, now it's five and four. But you, you don't have that same level of representation of blacks at the higher levels of CUNY. In no. the central office. Central correct. office, That's graduate correct. center, university deans. It's right. pretty much zero. Right. Well, so, and, and those are the levels that implement the programs that you say are important. Right. Right. So if you don't have people at right. those levels to, to right. demonstrate that this is an important issue, right. you're going to continue, I think, to get increasing numbers, but to remain flat. Okay. And I, I hear your point about being able to retain, but I'd like to also know, of the total number, and I didn't have it in the documentation that I have here, it was in previous reports on CUNY diversity, the workforce, how many people applied, Right. how many people were interviewed, right. and how many people accepted. So we need to have that broader picture as well. You, you are absolutely right, and that is something that the Faculty Diversity Working Group has been tracking. We also want to do exit interviews, Chair Barron, so we can understand why people leave. But you're right, we need to do better jobs of tracking our hires, making sure that, um, that uh, the percentage of people invited for interviews reflects the percentage in an applicant pool. I believe that this year, the first year that we started tracking, in fact, I, President Cruz, you've, you, you may know the numbers better than I do if you could discuss that. So in the year since we established the Chancellor's Faculty Diversity Working Group, um, one of the major areas of focus of the group was to really look at the searches for this past year. If we're going to um, fund a certain number of searches, let's look, pay particular attention to those searches that are for programs that have underutilization 
and make sure that we track every single step of the way to identify where the, the roadblocks are to um, yielding a large number of diverse um, hires, ultimately. Um, from the uh, searches that were conducted last year, the preliminary data that we have of the 90 searches in, in departments that had underutilization that were completed and verified, 45% of the applicants for those 90 searches um, were from underrepresented minority groups, yet 54.4% of those hired were from the represented minority groups. Um, so it, it looks like, as tends to be the case, when you're very focused on, on outcomes, right. it makes a difference. Um, and I have, I can share some data specific from Lehman if you'd like, but at, at the system level, that's what it looked like. And Chair Dan, I would say that we are getting very focused on outcomes and on documenting the process. And further, we are holding colleges responsible for faculty diversity in the performance management process. In your mass, okay, in the CUNY master plan uh, for 2012-2016, it said that uh, City College was going to create a Council of Inclusion and Excellence, which would recommend strategies and approaches to ensure diversity in departments as well as departmental and executive committees. Do we know what was the what was the uh, what were the results? Of and City how College. right right or if the if CUNY has a broad program, are we tracking those results? Um, I mean, it's great to put it in a plan and say this is what we're going to do. But when I looked at the following year's plan for 2016, 2020, yes. I didn't see any follow-up. I didn't see any data that talked about what the previous year's plan had implemented and said they would do. Right. Um, so we can't just have it, you know, throw it in a plan and say we're going to do it and not have some data, hard data, that comes back and tells us, you know, how we, how we were able to achieve that can tell you that as early as 2013, we started requiring, um, I was not in the central office then, but I know that we started requiring diversity plans from every college and um, with, with targets and, um, and started um, supports. But I can speak best from the two six, 2016 on Chair Barron when I've been in the office. And, uh, and the um, new master plan came out, which I had a hand in, in writing. And it is true that we did not, um, we provided date, a baseline data, but I'm not sure that we had outcomes of all the programs that we had uh, previewed in the 2012 to 2016 plan. I, that's right, but we've, we're tracking things now, and we're tracking things in a way we never tracked them before. In terms of the departments, you indicated that, uh, I think you said there were five schools that had majors majors yes. in Africana studies. Right. right. What, what are the requirements? Who determines if there's going to be an Africana study department or any other studies department? What, what do, makes that determination? What um, is that what a college president decision? The is college president is the ultimate decider. Of course, there has to be faculty will. The usual case there would be that I believe it's seven faculty that exist in other departments, or it sometimes new people might be um, hired to, uh, who are willing to be part of the new department. But it's ultimately the president's decision if the president will commit the resources. Departments are expensive entities. They require staff. They require other than personnel service budgets. They require most, most precious, most expensive full-time faculty lines. Um, departments must have, uh, at CUNY, departments need to have a minimum of five faculty or if the number falls beneath five, a commitment to get to five full-time faculty in the program to make it a department. Programs don't have those same rules. And what would be the rank that would be required of the faculty in a department? Okay, yes, you want to. I think as long as there are full-time faculty and there's interest, 
um, with the president's blessing in terms of the budget, facilities, mm -hmm. um, willingness to hire more faculty. Um, another important component is student interest. Mm -hmm. If there are students who are interested in seeing a particular major, um, then it can be developed. And you can be a full-time faculty member, which means you could be a lecturer or instructor with a particular knowledge base that can um, participate in the writing of the degree program. So what do we expect of schools that have a department with only two or three full-time persons? If that department is in fact listed in their catalog and described as offering um, classes, what would we expect the president to do to ensure that you have the faculty there that can provide the sections, the courses that are needed so that students would be encouraged? I'm interested in it, as you indicated, help to direct you when you were at Rutgers. How do we then support that if we don't have the adequate number of personnel? And what would be the expectation of a time period to fill those kinds of vacancies so that students don't say, listen, I can't continue to stay in this department because they don't have the course selections that I need to gather my credits to be able to graduate in a timely fashion. Very fair question, Sylvia. Um, obviously, if a department falls to, say, three or four uh, full-time faculty, there needs to be a commitment to build back should also be if the department has one student. Is that mic on? Oh. I'm sorry. Okay. Is that good? Um, if a department has shrunk significantly uh, and is in the state of having three or four members because people have left, you would want an analysis of why people left. Um, because that's, that's an important part of the picture. And what you can do to get back to strength there, one way to go would be to um, promise an investment based on a department. Again, it's a, it's a negotiation and a conversation between the leadership and the faculty about what is the direction of this department? How do we, you know, what is our best future uh, as, a, uh, as a unit that produces scholarship and that educates our students? And how should that vision inform our hiring and our uh, direction with regard to academic programs? I would think that a college president who has established departments across the various disciplines would want to make sure that the appropriate support, financial yes. and otherwise, yes. is given. And I would question why if been, over a period of time that issue is not addressed, why it has not been addressed. You're right. An analysis needs to be made. You, you're absolutely right. We, um, there, there are reasons that departments um, f uh, fall into uh, difficulty, and it happens in, uh, in many other areas, including foreign languages, and you do expect leadership to take a constructive role. What role does uh, the chancellery and the board of trustees and those other uh, bodies, what role does, do, they, do they play in finding out why this is happening, yeah. why it hasn't been why addressed? And why it hasn't been addressed. Um, frankly, the chancellery has not taken an active role in departmental business on the campuses, um, to my knowledge, Chair Barron. I've only been in the chancellery for less than four months, mm -hmm. but I've not seen that, but I've been university provost and I've not seen that level. However, um, if invited in by the department or the, um, or the president, I think it, you know, it, it could be appropriate. But again, one would do so carefully. Presidents are the chief executives of their institutions and one doesn't, one, one needs to respect that as well. I certainly do, you know, yes. as having been a principal in That's the right. Department of Education, That's right. I certainly understand that the person at the head, right. the person with the obligation yes. to address all of the issues uh, has to give that, has to be given that kind of responsibility, and I, I, I certainly agree. understand that. 
Uh, I have more questions, but I'm going to turn now to Council Member Holden, who has some questions. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chancellor. Um, I have, having served on the PNB in my department at, at City Tech for almost 20 years, mm -hmm. and um, been involved in hundreds of searches for, and we tried to get black faculty, um, but got little help from the administration over the years. We would do searches, mm -hmm. and we'd get back s stacks of resumes, but we had no way of knowing um, who, you know, the ethnicity or, or um, you know, um, background of the person, um, the race of the person, let's say. So we had to go out, actually, and recruit ourselves, black mm -hmm. faculty, uh, and we did. And I always thought, and I mentioned this at one of the hearings, we had over 100 adjunct faculty, which the administration to this day really were, they were reluctant. They always thought the grass was greener on the other side. They always thought we should look outside the university or outside the institution. We would recruit from other states, which I could never, I said, well, you know, and then lose the faculty that would say, we, offered, we gave them an offer, and they would say, well, we can't afford to live in New York City <laughs> from Minnesota. So we lost countless faculty like that. But to the life of me, and by the way, we did hire um, the chairman of my department at that time, actually recruited a black faculty member. That person is now the chair of the, de of the department, the first chair, first black chair uh, in the history of the department. And several other black faculties uh, members were terrific. Uh, adjunct faculty that we had in the department were terrific, but it was very difficult to hire them. So I, I think if the, the, if the university is very serious about hiring black faculty, that they need to look within in their adjunct staff and, and make it, you know, actually get involved in department searches. M the administration did not help us in the searches. They would post in the usual places, but there was no effort to, re to recruit black faculty. Most of our students w were black, so why not do that? And, uh, and we couldn't understand that. We'd have a tough time. We needed help from the university. We didn't get it. So I think knowing, and you can see the numbers are flat, yes. and there's a reason for that, because the university didn't have the will. Mm -hmm. So if the university gets serious about this, um, then the numbers will improve. But as you can see, the proof is in the pudding. We're not seeing we're seeing a flat line. We're not seeing an increase. So something needs to be done. And we need to know, this committee needs to know in the future what you plan to do, Some better than what you're doing now, because it's not working. Okay. Um, Council member, I appreciate that. But what I would say is this. Many of the initiatives I've talked about are relatively new. They've been implemented, frankly, in the last couple of years. No but, but they have to trickle down to the, each institution because the college presidents somehow are not getting the memos. I Listen, you, you've got to hold me to this. You've got to hold CUNY to this. But I think they are getting the memo. I think I'm, maybe I'm being an optimist and I will go to each of my colleagues. But I believe there has been in the past few years and I credit our board with this. I credit, um, I, I credit many w with this, and I want to be a part of this movement. I see something of a culture change where this isn't even CUNY just saying, you must do better. We're saying, we must do better. We all bear responsibility for this. But I'm going to ask Claudia or Jose Luis to, to add your own. I just wanted to add, it was a couple of years ago, um, the university provided I think it was a university that provided funding for adjuncts to be converted into full-time lines. Okay. So um, yeah. long-standing adjuncts, um, colleges got, uh, I guess, funding yes. to turn them into full-time positions. And, 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 and I remember there was a lot of interest around that, and there were long-standing adjuncts who could meet you know, what we were looking for, and they became full-time faculty members. Um, and in addition to that, I think recently, maybe as recent as two years ago, um, adjuncts can now teach up to three three classes, and that was impossible before. And I just want to say that you have full-time faculty in the department, and nobody wants to be a very lean department. Right. But at the same time, we can't um, we can't, can't undervalue the role that adjuncts play. 
in teaching because they bring such sometimes a wide range of experience and a wealth of experience to the classroom as well. So while you may not have a department that has you know five or six faculty members, you might have a very small department that needs to grow, but then you have dynamic adjuncts who could really make a difference in the classroom as well. So um, that should not you know go undervalued. Um, the only thing with the adjuncts, they don't really get the office, they get one office hour if they have nine hours, I think, or six hours. No, nine hours. If they have nine hours of teaching load, they get one hour. Six. Off. Is it six? Six. It's six? Okay, then it's changed maybe slightly. But so they get one hour of office time, which is not really a lot to mentor students. Um, so, you know, what I'm, you know, over the years, Yes, it has improved, but it's very difficult for the P and V's or the, the appointments committee that we call it, to get help from the administration. I found it very difficult. And as president of the college, and welcome to the university as a, a president, um, it's terrific. Um, would you, I mean, we advanced, let's say we advanced three candidates for one position. Many times the president or the deans would not even interview those candidates. So, and I asked the president of Queens College if if he would int automatically interview the person that the P and B or the appointments committee advanced, and he said yes, but my college president many times did not interview the people that we advanced. So we kind of we, uh, we came in. We used to come in during the summers, actually, when we were off to interview candidates. We worked through the entire summer on our time, and then would not the, the the president would not even or the deans would not even interview the person, and that's what that was frustrating. I think that there's a different generation of leaders on the college campuses. As provost, I interviewed all faculty, all finalists. If there were four finalists, I wanted to see everyone. Um, and the president will meet with new faculty as well. And I, you know, Jose Luis is shaking his head because I'm sure he does the same thing. And I know I'm nine days in at Kingsborough, I'll be meeting with the faculty. So this is a different Great. generation well, of college presidents. I hope so. Thank you so much. And if I may uh, just add a, a local data point uh, in reference to the chancellor's uh, mention that we have these new initiatives in place that we are uh, very confident will, will move the needle faster as we move forward. Um, this past year, as Eden College conducted its uh, 11 searches um, based on this concept of, of looking at every part of the search process in a very methodical way to eradicate underutilization. I'm proud to say that of the nine searches that we completed, um, we uh, hired 11 uh, new faculty members, eight um, of which are representing minority groups, so 73%. So by uh, focusing on the new approach that the Chancellor mentioned um, on our campus, we're seeing significant uh, movement. Um, we basically uh, reduce underutilization in biological and biomedical sciences, mathematics, um, in physical sciences and psychology, which as you know are, are difficult uh, disciplines to recruit for. Thank you. The 2012-2016 the master plan identified some initiatives that CUNY would use to promote faculty diversity. And that was the CUNY Latino Faculty Initiative mm -hmm the Faculty Fellowship Publications Program, and the Diversity Projects Development Program. So that was in the 2012-16 plan. And now here in your testimony today, you talk about the Chancellor's Opportunity Fund for Strategic Recruitment and Retention, the CUNY Mellon Faculty Diversity Career Enhancement Initiative, the Mid-Career Faculty Fellowship Program, and uh, diversifying CUNY's leadership, the CUNY Harvard Consortium. So do we expect that each time we come up with a master plan, there'll be different initiatives? And do we get to see an evaluation of what the prior initiatives were able to generate? What were the results? Yeah why we're no longer using that, it didn't work, um, or we've achieved what we set out to do with that initiative, it's no longer relevant. Right. Um, because how can, we get, how can we get to see growth if we're changing initiatives every four yeah. years 
rather than saying we're going to enhance it or give us at least an explanation for why right. we don't see the same initiatives continued. Right. right. Um, some of those initiatives most certainly have continued and okay. have good results. For example, the uh, faculty fellowship publication okay. program is not only continuing, it's vibrant. Okay. It's, um, and there, what it seeks to do is provide support for scholars, scholars of color, many who've wor who work in interdisciplinary areas, work in areas that 30 years ago were not even respectable and now are recognized as important areas of scholarship. It enables them to, to um, meet criteria, to get promoted, tenured, and all of that. Those work well. The Latino faculty initiative was certainly a, uh, um, an important um, initiative uh, to increase the percentage of Latino faculty, which lagged behind the explosion of Latino students in CUNY over the past decade, and Latino faculty have increased in number at, at all ranks. Is that initiative and still in place? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, and Chair Barron, I can get you some figures on those. You mentioned another um, uh, Mellon program. Um, well, in the 2012, it listed uh, the Diversity Project Development Fund to support scholarly yeah. research projects, other educational and professional activities. Right, that continues diverse. today, okay. yes. Yes, it does continue, and again, it is successful. Okay. Okay. Okay, and so what is the status of the postdoctoral fellowship program, which was implemented to diversify the pool of potential faculty, which follows along the issue of Councilmember Holden's uh, point? Um, the postdoctoral fellowship pro program. Fellows, um, postdoctoral fellowship program. Actually, I do not. Uh, is this the Mellon funded uh, program, uh, Mr. Holden, or is this Councilman? Mellon funded, okay. I believe that is a relatively new program, um, but I, I don't, uh, the postdoctoral fellowship program, I confess, Chair Barron, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I will find, I will find out okay, for you. Okay, because it was a part of the 2012 Okay, master then it's plan. not a new program. Okay. And I do not, I, I do not know. Okay, um, and the CUNY Diversity Scholar in Residence Program, I'm not sure which year that was in, uh, but again, we have these we have these initiatives that that are right. implemented, right. and right. then right. they fall off. Or we don't or know what happened. Or they change their that names, continue. or that's that, fine. That's that, right. That's right. If they evolve to something else, that's fine. But we need to be able to track them to track them to be able to find out Fair what point. were the results of all of that. So okay. we'll send okay. you um, we'll send you a yes. list of those. Okay. And, and then my point comes to, I know you have to get ready to go, and I do want to respect right. your time. No, thank um, I appreciate that. In regards to, you said the Latino faculty initiative, initiative right. was very successful yes. in increasing the number of faculty, yes. and that's good to know. But once again, yeah. in the totality, we're saying that it's flat. Latino, so what can we do, yeah. what can we do to focus on getting an increase a significant increase in black hires yes. that will move the needle from yes. being flat at 15%. Uh, that, that, yeah, no, you're, you're right. Even the increase this year from 12 to 15%, not a, not, not a lot, right? I, I agree, but it's, again, this, the challenge is something, we have to meet it, Chair Barron. We're, so we're, I think we need to get something concrete Okay. Uh, we, we're agreeing on the concept and the principle and you know the values and how important and how great, but we have to get something we concrete do. that makes it a reality. Right. And I think that having the black and Latino representation at president's level is good, but it's gotta be significantly reflected above and it's gotta percolate down percolate to the down. departments as you're well. You're right, you're right. And in terms of the departments, when we were uh, doing our studies, we found that at City University, I think, they have the Latino, Black, and Jewish Studies Department in one. And I want to know how that happened. Okay, I'm I'm, glad, I'm happy to tell you, it didn't happen. Okay. Um, um, I, I 
Chair Barron, I, I know why you think that it, it this is what you would I'm call I'm just like, saying what I saw, and okay. if it didn't happen, I'm... It didn't happen. Okay. It's, a re it's, it's an artifact of our computer coding in the registrar's office. Those are, uh, there is actually no Puerto Rican uh, department or program. It's uh, uh, Latin and Latin American studies. Those are three separate areas. They have no okay. relation to each other except that they are in City College's division in, of arts and the humanities, but they are separate programs. I'm okay. pleased to say I, I did some digging after the question. Okay, great. Okay. Um, do you have any other questions? Just, just one more question. Um, do you now require departments? I mean, I know it goes from the chancellor's office to the presidents of the of the each institution, but couldn't you require each department in their searches to demonstrate how they were reaching out to black faculty yes. in, in, in a way, and given the resources to advertise or to actually recruit? from those institutions? Yes, in fact, we do require that, um, that, that the kind of advertising you talked about, um, Council Member Holden, where you didn't advertise in, um, in, the, in publications that reach uh, uh, Latino and, and black scholars, Th that can't happen anymore. You have to, in order for a search to be approved, you have to state what you're um, going to do. And, no and how recent, recent is that, though? Is that the, within the last two years only? Well, we've certainly sharpened it in the faculty diversity working group. President Cruz, might you say anything more about that? Yes, so as part of the faculty diversity working group and our focus on this past year's recruitment cycle, um, a series of steps were put in place, and one of them is that before a search can be launched, an approved recruitment plan needs to be uh, in place. And so if there's underutilization in a particular search, um, that search committee had to put together an advertising plan in, in uh, communication with the chief diversity officer of the campus. But we need a report from the institution, actually, as an outcome. Did they follow through? Um, and, you know, we need accountability here at this point. Because, I, I, again, on the, on the department level, we felt frustrated because that we, many of our candidates were ignored. And I don't think that should happen, and the, and the college president should not participate in that. Exactly. So, so basically, the way this, the process is structured uh, this past year, um, after that uh, plan was put in place, there was another checkpoint um, to make sure that the pool was diverse before the committee could even uh, select the short list. Right. And then another one at the end, and before an offer was made, there had to be a certification from the chief diversity officer that all of the steps had been complied with. Chair Barron, I'm afraid I, I need to, to go to, to get to your... Yes, I appreciate that. But if your uh, presidents could stay, yes. I just want to have a few follow-up questions for them okay. uh, so Thank that they'll you. be able to relay them to you. Thank you. And I know you have other staff that stays as well. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank, Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, in terms of faculty demographics, if you don't have the information, perhaps you can give us a follow-up. You talk, I would like to know, across the university, which are the academic disciplines that boast the largest number of faculty? So within, if you don't have it, I would like to get we that information. We can provide that. Okay. And which college, which campus, are both on the senior and, and community level, has the most black faculty? And... Uh, which one has the fewest, and how does it compare to the enrollment of black students at those, at those campuses? And in terms of departments, is the, I understand that it's uh, under the purview of the college president, but is there a dollar ratio matched to the enrollment of students at the college which would determine how much money a college professor could designate to a particular department? My understanding is it varies from college to college. So um, is that the discretion of the president? Yes, at the, at, I, I can speak about Lehman College. Yes. Um, basically, there is a formula that we use for the other than personnel services. Right. 
um, allocation based on enrollment. Um, and that's on enrollment not just for majors and minors, but also takes into account the service component uh, of the curriculum. Um, faculty lines, there are other considerations that are taken into account uh, that look at trends in enrollment patterns, that look at disciplinary needs, accreditation needs of certain disciplines, and based on the funding availability and the number of lo new lines that are available, then decisions are made um, in consultation with the school deans. Okay. And um, a question that you would probably have to refer back to uh, the interim chancellor, that in June of 2018, the Board of Trustees received a Rockefeller Foundation gift in the amount of $666,666 for <laughs> that. That's what they gave. I'm glad you caught that. Uh, to support CUNY's initiatives to help diversify the workforce uh, of the cultural sector. So we'd like to know how, we'd ask that you respond in the future, how the gift was made to the Research Foundation, how much of that money will go directly to uh, each student that's enrolled in the CUNY Cultural Corps, because we understand that's what it was earmarked for. And is it uh, only low income that's the qualifying factor for the fellowship, or was perhaps race or ethnicity uh, a factor in awarding that? And uh, Council Member Holden, if, do you have any questions? If not, we'll move on. Okay, I just wanna thank you. And I was interested in knowing what were the organizations that you work with in East New York? I worked at Downstate, uh, I worked at Downstate Medical Center, mm -hmm. and I was a developmental specialist. So I worked um, with Kingsborough, um, Kings, 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 Kings Hospital. County Hospital okay. and Downstate Hospital. And okay. we would go into the homes and work with the infants. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Appreciate your testimony. We look forward to getting answers to the other questions. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll now call the next panel. Okay, the next panel will be doc, Dr. Arthur Lewin from Baruch College, uh, Diane Bennett from the African Mer uh, Studies Department at City Tech, and Aceton Kone, I hope I, Aceto Kone, please help me with the name, from City College, the Black Institute. Hi. You give it to the clerk. The, the lady that's oh, right I'm here. Sorry. <laughs> yes, have a seat. And I'm going to ask the council to administer the oath. Good morning. Uh, would you raise your right hands? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Please state your names for the record. Thank you. You may begin. Just push the button to make sure the red light comes on and you'll be re recorded. Hi, let me see, can you hear me? Okay, thank you so much. 
uh, for inviting us uh, to be here. Uh, my name is Dr. Dion Bennett. I am an assistant professor uh, in the African American Studies Department at City Tech. Um, and I am proud to represent the African American Studies Department and to bring greetings from our uh, chair, Dr. Mar Marta Effinger Critchlow, who unfortunately was unable to be here, so she sent me, and I was very happy to do so. I want to thank um, the committee for holding <laughs> this, uh, this meeting and, and particularly thank you uh, for your uh, commitment uh, to this issue, which is very, very important to us. Um, the African American Studies Department at City Tech has been in existence since uh, 1969, so uh, one of the earlier departments in the country. Uh, in fact, uh, we offer a rich interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary educational experience as we explore the African diaspora through the humanities and social sciences. We have five full-time faculty members, 12 adjunct faculty, uh, and we uh, all engage in what we consider robust research and artistic work. Uh, we share our experiences in the field through place-based learning and try to encourage our students to connect to the city of New York as their laboratory um, and uh, their uh, a research site for them. Uh, we are glad to have institutional funding from the college uh, to enable us to sponsor events like Black Solidarity Day, Kwanzaa Black History Month, and Women's History Month. Uh, these events feature intellectual community and cultural leaders, as well as media and arts presentations. And we are uh, amongst uh, the most prolific of the organizations on campus in, ter in terms of uh, creating uh, intellectual and cultural uh, events and activities. Uh, because we are a com commuter campus and serve a diverse student population, including a very large population of students of African descent, uh, these events are intellectually and culturally valuable to students of all backgrounds. We work with the Student Government Association as well as the Black Male uh, Initiative. Uh, we attempt to collaborate and connect with the student community both within and beyond the classroom. We don't think our work as educators ends uh, when we walk out of the classroom. In order to support the development of students into the, the intellectual, professional, ethical, and creative leaders we believe they can be, um, African American studies as a discipline and the labor of African American faculty both inside and outside of the discipline we believe play an essential role in fulfilling both the City Tech and CUNY mission of providing a superb urban education to students who may possess limited resources but absolutely possess limitless potential. Um, we recognize that the experience of our department may differ from that uh, of other uh, departments across the university, and we would like to state that we supor support all efforts to ensure that every African American Studies program and department has the so full support of CUNY, and uh, we also support the hiring and retention of black faculty in all departments, not just Africana Studies departments uh, and colleges uh, throughout the CUNY uh, system. Um, and if I may add, just as an individual uh, intellectual and citizen, I think it's important. Uh, I was inspired by the chairwoman's uh, statements at the beginning, and so I just added uh, something, that it's important to remember uh, that African American studies is not a a demographic depository. Uh, it is a discipline that defines and defends democracy um, and its most fundamental sense, and that at times like these where we are a democracy in transition and uh, some may find it vulnerable, um, African American studies is particularly essential to the work uh, that we as a society uh, claim to be invested in doing. So I want to just add that. So I was inspired by what you said at the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Councilwoman Barron and uh, Councilman uh, Holden for having this very important hearing. I want to talk about the disappearance of black faculty and black studies at Baruch College. Uh, let, us, let us place the issue of the shrinking black faculty at Baruch College and the dismantling of its black and Latino studies department in context. Since the 1960s, the prison population of the U.S. has increased tenfold from 250,000 mostly white inmates to 2.5 million mainly black and Latino inmates. Most, and this is important, most of the babies born in the United States today, September 27, 2018, 
are children of color. This has been so for five years and their proportion is steadily increasing. Most of the children in the public schools in the United States as a whole, taken as a whole, are children of color. This has been so for five years and their proportion is steadily increasing. Uh, the chancellor said something about majority, minority. I don't know, wh what does that mean? Okay, the New York City public schools spend $23,000 per student each year. Yes, $23,000. And blacks and Latinos, the vast majority of the student populace have a 33% dropout rate. There are precious few blacks or Latinos in New York City specialized high schools and their numbers in the senior colleges of CUNY are steadily decreasing. The disappearing black faculty at Baruch College and the elimination of the black and Latino studies department at Baruch, one of only two such joint departments in the nation, is but one example of how this country is foolishly destroying its youth, the future of our nation. Focusing specifically on Baruch College, from fall 2010 to fall 2016, Baruch College hired 119 full-time faculty. Three of them were black. That's 2.5%, the lowest number and percentage of black hires of all CUNY colleges. Next lowest was Staten Island. 4.6% of their hires were black, nearly twice that of Baruch College. Baruch College's own 2017 Affirmative Action Report admits that if the college were hiring proportional to the available pool of candidates, its 505 full-time faculty would have 35 more black professors. Uh, we don't have 35 now, okay, but anyway. <laughs> in recognition of this dismal fact, the administration in its 2013 strategic diversity plan pledged that it would have periodic meetings with black faculty and Latino staff to uncover the problems they face in getting reappointed, tenured, and promoted. Five years later, the first such meeting has yet to occur. And they're drawing up another plan with a lot of other foolishness that they never, that they never carry through. All kind of uh, things are promised, but nothing happens. Uh, one of the things that was said uh, is uh, talking about full-time faculty. I know uh, uh, Professor Holden knows this, that full-time and tenure are not the same thing. People are not leaving Baruch College and other schools to go somewhere else. They're leaving because they're not getting tenure. That's why they're leaving. They're being kicked out. Uh, the problem of retaining black and Latino staff is particularly acute in the black and Latino studies department. It, it is currently down to just three professors. Now, uh, you know, the Baruch administration will not allow it to hire a replacement for those that leave. So I don't understand what was said about, you know, if it drops below a certain level, there has to be a commitment. What commitment? There is no commitment. We thus witnessed the slow, deliberate destruction of the black and Latino studies department through unaddressed attrition. And I've written everybody at CUNY Central, including Dr. Rabinowitz, when she was provost and everybody down there, they don't respond. There have been six changes of, diver of chief diversity office at Baruch College in five years. Doubtless this contributes, and one person, they, they, they fired her and brought her back. Doubtless this contributes to the failure to address, let alone resolve, any of these issues. How come the most dysfunctional unit in the college just happens to be the one that promotes diversity and inclusion? What a coincidence. Uh, Baruch's black student population has been cut in half in recent years. This is part and, part and parcel of the overall trend to exclude and marginalize people of color in every single facet of this society. Sadly, the Baruch administration has abandoned CUNY's traditional vaunted leadership role, choosing instead to go with the flow. That's President Wallerstein, that's Provost David Christie, and Dean Aldemaro Romero of the School uh, of Liberal Arts. And I don't want, you know, just again, I don't understand this whole idea of minority uh, and majority. I, I just don't get it. This country, we are the future of the country. If you, if you, if we're not educating the black and Latino youth of this country and we're not bringing black and Latino people into the mainstream, we're not gonna have any country. Thank you. My name is um, Asetu Cohn. I am a student at the City College of New York. I'm a junior. Um, 
As a first generation African American, I select most of my courses due to a requirement, but also what I wish to comprehend in life. I've selected courses such as Caribbean heritage, Afro-Latino Afro literature, and political systems of Africa. All these courses represent the diversity within the black community, and it makes me wonder how would a Department of African American Studies be structured around those principles. An example, the University of Yale describes their African American Studies as courses that are innovative, complex, and distinctively African American social structures and cultural traditions that Africans in the, the diaspora have created, which is really vague if you look at it. Um, once we take into account the era of the post-slave trade, how are we explaining the history of separation and distribution that the black community has endured and how that contrib contributed to the social, economic, and political growth of the Africans in the Americas? If there is to be an African American studies in the city universities of New York, these details must be taken into account to either become a concentration or its own department. The lack of a well-structured African American studies department may also be an explanation to the lack of black professors in the CUNY system. From 2014 to 2017, the hiring of black professors has been a stagnant 12%. While there are 24% black students in the city universities of New York and 30% Hispanic, contrary to the 22% white, this number drastically goes down after graduate school. We see a decrease of African Americans when it comes to professional studies and faculty hiring. These two situations are in direct correlation. Therefore, as a black student, I can only ask myself, how hard would it be if I wanted to become a CUNY professor and teach relevant courses that embody true African-American um, education? Thank you. Thank you. I want to thank the panel for coming and for your testimony. Uh, Dr. Lewin, just um, a couple of follow-up questions. You talk about the fact that faculty is not leaving but is being kicked out. Right. How is that uh, demonstrated? Okay, it's demonstrated by the fact that um, when you're hired, you're given a certain period of time. It can range from five to seven years right. in order to get tenure, in order to become, you know, in order to become a permanent right. uh, person. But what tends to happen is that each year, as you move towards tenure, they put more and more pressure on you. They, they, they try to find excuses to, to attack you, your work, your research, your any, anything that they possibly can. And then by the time you finally, uh, uh, time to be awarded tenure, you just don't get it. And, and these reports, these affirmative action reports that the schools put out, they don't even differentiate uh, what is tenure and what is full time. It just simply says full time. So what you basically have is a revolving door, people coming in and leaving. And then they say they can't find anybody. Uh, uh, Professor Holden talked about how they wouldn't let him even, you know, hire the, the, the local people. They love to say, we just, we just can't find anybody. That's what they love to say, right? They love to do that. And, and what they love to, and, and another thing, I just want to say this, I'm not attacking my, uh, the president of, of, of Kingsborough and, and the president of, um, was it Lehman? They may have a, a, a very well integrated uh, staff, but that's why they were here. They're exception to prove the rule. And what tends to happen is that anybody that uh, tends <coughs> to talk about these things, they tend to kick you upstairs. They, they, they tend to say, well, oh, okay, let's, let's set up a committee. You go ahead and you go take, you know, <laughs> you know and, and no, nothing gets done. It's just public relations. That's all they do. Um, so I, I agree with everything that you're saying. And I think it is, if, if you're just counting bodies, it looks like you have yes. the bodies, but it's at the tenure process that black faculty uh, gets pushed out. Um, so that's one, one thing. And so then, and then they get replaced at a lower level. And so it looks like you have the same number of bodies, but you actually don't have the bodies moving into the senior levels that have the actual influence in changing the culture of the, of the institution. So it looks fine, it looks stable, but it's actually not always stable. It's often uh, people getting pushed out before they can actually accumulate power. And um, I'm an anthropologist. My PhD is in anthropology from UCLA. I think I may be, if I'm not the, only um, person trained in psychological anthropology, black person trained in psychological anthropology, I'm maybe one of two. Um, 
I, it would be very difficult for me to get a job in an anthropology uh, department. I'm in an African American studies department. So what happens is the African American studies department be kind of become the place where the black faculty is funneled and then the other departments take no responsibility or very little responsibility for recruitment and retention. And then that puts this enormous pressure on, on the African American studies departments to kind of hold on to the faculty. And if you have a strong department, you know, it, it works out. If you have a weak uh, African American studies department or if the department isn't supported, that means that black faculty throughout the university or throughout the college kind of collapse. Also, the other thing that happens is the African American studies departments uh, become support uh, sites for uh, black faculty outside of African American studies. So again, if you don't have a strong department, then you also don't have the support for black faculty outside of the department. So I just wanted to add. add also, I want to point out, uh, you remember I was here a few years ago, and it was a, a young lady with me that was here with us, uh, was a young lady and a young man. And what happened was uh, the young lady went to the best Ivy League schools. She was, uh, she, she had the, the top ratings in her, in her department for teaching, and they wouldn't even interview her. She ended up leaving and suing the college successfully with the EEOC. And another oh, right. Yeah, she sued. Remember. She sued. She sued Baruch College, and then another the gentleman that was here, Mr. Uh, I don't want to give his name, but the gentleman that was here, he was a c counselor, and he was doing an excellent job. They just simply, you know, they just simply ejected him. And you know what happens? Anytime you talk about these things, what they do is they will have you go speak. They will they will put out front somebody like the dean of students has nothing to do with hiring people, but because they're a black or Latino. They are the spokesperson for these issues. They do that. They do that consistently. Um, thank you. I have another question, Councilmember Holden. Um, Dr. Lewin, thank you for your testimony. Thanks to the panel. Um, when did you write to the Chancellor about Baruch and? Um, do you have over the past two years? Two I can years, give you, and I can give you the correspondence. If you never, yes, if you can do that, never got any. You never got an answer. Never. I wrote. Th I didn't just write. That's disgraceful. I never got an answer from the chancellor. Nor I wrote the whole cabinet, including uh, Doctor Rab whatever what Rabino was. Rabino. I wrote her too. Never got anything back. And and the thing that's galling is that when they point out things like if it drops below five, they got to make a commitment. You ask her. Well, who's well, it's up to the president? There's no enforcement. It's just they just put things on paper, and they waste your time. You see, what happened is this: with the black and Latino faculty, you publish and you still perish. You publish, they don't respect what you write, and if you do write something good, you know it's it it it's they, they'll always find something. But the thing is, you're making a good point, Councilman uh, Councilwoman uh, Barron. You're making a very good point that you need to have black and Latino faculty to mentor these black and Latino students and to show everybody that we are people of accomplishment and to include what we do in the curriculum. The reason you have a black studies department, a white, a black studies department, a Latino studies department, Asian American studies department, Native American, uh, a lesbian, gay uh, department, et cetera, et cetera, is because essentially what we have is white studies. We have male Eurocentric white studies from the bottom to the top of the curriculum, right across the board. How, how can we, um, I appreciate all of your testimony, and I appreciate the fact that a part of the reason this hearing is taking place is besides it, it's something that we're interested in is that a particular person said to me directly, no, this is a real issue and we need to address it. And I said, fine, we'll do that. How can we look to see how the information of what is going on on the ground within the ivy walls is collected in some type of centralized location or by a collective of people who understand what the issues are so that they can be brought to the public. The, the, okay, I think we have to have, this thing, these things have to be brought out and publicized. 
for example, I will guarantee you that not one in 100 people in New York City know that we're spending $23,000 per child with a 33% dropout rate. Nobody knows that, right? I've written to the newspapers. There's, there's a show that replaced Like It Is called, as it, but I don't know what the show is called on, on Channel 7. Yeah. yeah, but they're not talking about here and now, you see. <laughs> I've written them. They don't put it out there. You turn on the news, all you hear is nonstop Trump this, Trump that. The two biggest issues facing this country are the 2.5 million people in jail and the destruction of Puerto Rico. They say nothing about it. So what I'm trying to say is um, we have to find a way to get this out to the people. I, you know, I, I don't, I, you know, uh, this, this, this is great that we're doing this, and maybe we can somehow get this into the papers or get it on here Social and now. Media. Social well, media, we got to do something. Right, and, and that's the point that I'm raising. Uh, I would put out uh, an offer to us to form a collective, to form yes. an opportunity for people to join together, like-minded people who understand the situation as it exists, to form a body of people who will say, listen, here is the data of what's, and I'm not just talking about the numbers, it's beyond just the numbers, but the fact that at certain points, you know, your contract is ended and you've not been tenured and you're out, those kinds of uh, things. There are actually three professors who reach out to me and let me know, well, this is what's happening at my campus. Mm -hmm. But how can we extend that? How can we form uh, a body of people that can say, okay, listen, call the black, the black faculty organization of CUNY, whatever, whatever, and deposit your information so that we can take collective action. Right. I think we need protection. I'm an untenured. And that's part of the reason why I call this, so that yeah. I'm the council member, nobody's going to be able to say your job's in jeopardy, but we need to get the information right. so that we can move forward on your behalf. So a lot of it, so I'm an untenured faculty member. I'm scared right now to say certain things, like mm -hmm. things that I'm just not going to say mm -hmm. um, because it's not safe for me. Mm -hmm. And we need a, we need a collective... Um, that protects yes. the people who know. So, you know, it's one of those things where the people who say don't know and the people who know don't say because they can't. Um, we do need more senior faculty members. When the people are tenured, they have more freedom. And so if we prevent, and there are, I do think that people are prevented from becoming tenured, if, peop if people don't get to be tenured, then they are never in a position where they have the authority to tell the mm -hmm. complete truth. So having structures, what you're talking about as a collective, I think would be really, really powerful because it could protect faculty mm -hmm. for, uh, at all different levels so that, and so that we can protect students Students, I went to Yale. I was laughing that you said Yale was vague. Yale is it's worse <laughs> than vague, dear. Um, I, I, my BA is is uh, is from Yale. So we we need that that kind of protection. I think mm -hmm. uh, a structure of protection. I think the other thing we do need, and I'm not sure the best way to do this is we do need some a, a cultural transformation. One of the reason I mentioned the role of African American studies as a democracy defining and, uh, and defending structure is people act like this is just good for black people. Right. African American studies is not just good for black people. African American studies is good for America. Right. It is good for democracy. It is good for everybody. Um, and it deserves uh, the respect and the defense of that. And I think one of the things we, we need to do is we need to educate our peers who are outside of the discipline to understand the value of both uh, us as, as people and what we bring to the intellectual intellectual and academic experience of CUNY and what the discipline of African American studies brings to the academic and civic uh, work of, uh, of the country. This is the 50th anniversary. 2018 is the 50th anniversary of the discipline and I hardly hear anybody even talking about it. Um, but we wouldn't have had a black president if we didn't have African American studies. That wouldn't have happened. So I think we also need some cultural work uh, in terms of the intellectual culture of CUNY so that we get the respect that the discipline deserves. Thank you. I also want to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I also think it's very important to um, include students, which was um, just because they have very, like a lar very large reach and are able to communicate between each other. So I do think it's, um, this is a very obviously a discussion that 
definitely include students as well, um, student governments to have um, the p public affairs committee not only at demand where are these reports, how many students of color, and why are the why are these why is this happening? Why is this happening? I think that's definitely a discussion that's very necessary. <laughs> I want to thank you for coming, and I want to say that uh, I would love to be in touch after this event to talk about how we can establish that group that we talked about and make we'll it a reality. We'll certainly do that, Council okay. Councilwoman. Thank Beck. you so much. Thank you all so much for listening to us. We really thank you. appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. And we're going to call the next panel. We have um, Owen Brown from Mega Evers College. Dr. Anthony Brown from Hunter College, and Brenda Green from Mega Evers College. Thank you. I'm going to ask the council to have to administer the oath to you. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. I do. Please state your names for the record. Brenda Green. Anthony Brown. And Owen Brown. Thank you. You may begin with your testimony. Good morning. Uh, good morning, council member. Barron and Council Member Holden. Um, thank you for leading this effort to ensure that the city council members become more aware of the status of black faculty and black studies and Africana studies in CUNY. I am chair of the English department at Megervis College and executive director of the Center for Black Literature at Megervis College. My presentation will focus on black studies in CUNY. It's the result of a survey that I conducted with black studies programs and departments within CUNY and also a review of the 2018 quarterly report on faculty diversity. The names black studies and Africana studies are often interchangeable. So for the sake of consistency, I will use the term black studies in this presentation. An overview of black studies in CUNY. Five senior colleges currently offer black baccalaureate degree pro black studies in CUNY. These include City College, Brooklyn College, Hunter College, York College, and Lehman College. John Jay College, Queens College, New York City Tech, and Baruch offer black studies minors or concentrations. The Graduate Center offers an Africana Studies track within the Masters of Liberal Arts degree and a certificate in Africana Studies at the PhD level. The two senior colleges which offer no black studies programs are Mega Rivers College, ironically, and the College of Staten Island. The English department at Mega Rivers College offers an AA in African, African Diasporic Literature and has a BA in African Diasporic Literature under review. The social and behavioral so, Social and Behavioral Sciences Department at Megervis College is working on a degree in Africana Studies. Full 2017 data reveal that the percentage of black studies, black students at senior and community colleges is 24.7%, with the highest percentage at Megervis College, and that is 84.7%. Black studies in this report is included under area, ethnic, and cultural studies. The data from this report reveal that area, ethnic, and cultural studies have the lowest number of black faculty hires. 
From 2010 to 2016, the number of black faculty hired in this area was eight. In 2016 to 2017, the number of black faculty hired was two. We have strong black studies programs across, across CUNY. Um, Hunter, Lehman, and City have strong majors. Hunter has 30 majors and 70 minors. Lehman has 59 majors and 49 minors. And although City College does not have a black studies department, it has had as many as 93 majors and currently has about 60 majors. Lehman has seven full-time faculty, one of whom has a joint appointment and 10 adjunct faculty. Hunter has five full-time faculty and 14 part-time faculty. City College currently has two faculty. It lost four faculty due to retirement or resignation in the last three years, and the faculty have not been replaced. In my survey, I asked faculty across CUNY to identify the challenges and, and, and their recommended solutions in addressing black studies. Uh, the challenges are as follows. Although nearly 25% of students in CUNY are black, the institutional support for programs reflecting black studies has been reduced over the last three years. Colleges have failed to replace faculty who have retired or resigned, thereby affecting program growth and the number of black studies majors. Faculty have cited a lack of support from the administration as a rationale for resignation. In some colleges, there are no full-time or part-time faculty directly connected to the black studies program. There's a high attrition rate for directors and coordinators of black studies program. Programs. In one college, there have been five coordinators of black studies in 10 years. The administration cancels upper level black studies courses, thus eliminating courses needed for the major and affecting the retention of the program. One college reported that two black studies proposals submitted to CUNY within the past eight years for a major have been denied. Solutions. Black studies must be respected within the confines of the institution. The number of students who enroll in courses within black studies is not an issue. Students enroll in black studies courses in high numbers when they are offered. These courses should be supported within degree programs and with full-time faculty. Colleges must use deliberate strategies that support and retain black studies programs and faculty. CUNY should create a black studies discipline council that will be responsible for discussing and reviewing black studies within CUNY. English literature courses are not broadly represented in black studies, most are social science courses, related courses. A, deg a degree in African diasporic literature provides a niche in CUNY and supports an inter interdisciplinary approach to African diasporic literature. CUNY offers no master's degree in Africana or black studies. The graduate center should develop a black studies major a black studies master's degree program that is in concert with the foundation of black studies as a discipline and reflective of a broad range of thinkers across disciplines. Data on black studies programs and hires, black, black faculty hires within CUNY diversity reports um, need to be documented and should not be grouped under area studies. So I'm not gonna turn this over to my colleague, Anthony Brown, who's chair of the Africana and Puerto Rican and Latin Studies program at Hunter College, and he will be followed by Dr. Owen Brown, who's professor of sociology at Megervis College. I also have a, uh, attached to my uh, presentation an overview that reflects the, the, um, the programs, the, the degree offers, the number of full-time faculty, part-time faculty, and majors and the senior colleges across CUNY. That's part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Green. Um, good afternoon. 
I thank Councilwoman Barron, uh, Councilman Holden, for the opportunity to present today. I will focus my remarks on two crucial areas, uh, the recruitment and retention of black faculty. According to 2017 data, university-wide, 12% or 940 of CUNY's faculty are identified as black. The percentage of black faculty members varies significantly across senior and community colleges and within departments. CUNY can address these disparities through a targeted campus-specific approach that would significantly increase the number of black faculty across departments at both senior and community colleges. Recruiting black faculty. Recruitment of black faculty can be a challenge, particularly in departments with an uneven history of tenured black faculty. A strategy that has been successfully utilized by both public and private universities to address faculty diversity is cluster hiring. A cluster hire would involve hiring a critical mass of black faculty members based on shared interdisciplinary research interest. These hires could be in a single department or a cross-disciplinary research area that would provide the new hires with a community of scholars that would reduce feelings of isolation and marginalization. For CUNY, building on the university's research, teaching, demographics, and location, a cluster hire initiative would enhance the university's existing research capacity, contribute to new discoveries and applications of knowledge, and, ad and address real-world problems that require cross-disciplinary expertise. For example, a cluster hire initiative centered in Africana Studies departments around the theme of black futures would attract black faculty whose teaching and research focuses on challenges facing urban areas that might include race and social justice, education and or health disparities, urban housing, poverty, policing, and other topics that speak to persistent concerns facing New Yorkers. Research would be coordinated through a Black Futures CUNY-wide disciplinary group that would coordinate research, funding, cross-disciplinary collaborations, and the dissemination of research. Retention of black faculty. Keeping faculty from exiting a university is a pressing challenge for institutions. A high turnover rate of professors of color is a familiar reality as many campus leaders don't acknowledge some of the issues that black faculty and other faculty of color face on predominantly white campuses or departments and how that climate affects turnover. These issues include feelings of isolation, the burden of invisible labor, and hostile workplace environments. Therefore, building an environment that is inclusive and equitable will go a long way in helping faculty members feel safe and less marginalized in their new departments. For instance, conducting a survey or focus group on the climate in a department and campus can assist in identifying and strategizing how to ensure inclusivity. CUNY has conducted climate surveys in the past and additional research that addresses the concerns of black faculty should augment prior data. Strong mentoring is an effective method for promoting retention among underrepresented groups. In fact, numerous studies have shown mentoring to be an effective way to recruit, retain, and promote the advancement of faculty, and that the absence of or inadequate formal mentoring has disproportionately negative effects on black and Latinx faculty. Many report feelings of uh, isolated from informal and formal professional networks, which reduce opportunities to build broad-based networks necessary to successfully navigate the academy. The degree of association with supportive senior faculty as well as peers has been shown to be a strong predictor of success within the academy. In closing, as we move further into the 21st century, CUNY, CUNY is strategically positioned to significantly increase the number of black faculty through cluster hires who can unpack questions related to black futures and related concerns that can offer not only students but policymakers, researchers, and community leaders new knowledge and tools 
to discern and address issues that cohere around persistent forms of racial and ethnic inequality. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Owen Brown, and I'd like to begin by thanking Council Member Byron, Council Member Holden, and members of the Higher Education Committee for the opportunity to address this most important issue of diversity within CUNY full-time faculty ranks. I'm a prof professor of sociology at Marys College. My remarks today will focus on the need for CUNY faculty to reflect the diversity of the people who reside in New York City, the current state of African-American or black faculty members employed by CUNY, and finally, an important challenge that we all face. Historically, CUNY has helped immigrants afford a college education. This has led many of them to become productive workers and citizens who have contributed and who continue to contribute to the development of this nation and our great city. However, there's a lingering problem, and that problem is the continuing marginalization of minorities, in particular African Americans. This problem manifests itself in CUNY amongst its faculty in the area of full-time hires, tenure, and promotion. According to a 2017 report by CUNY's Office of Human Resource Management titled Quarterly Report on Faculty Diversity, CUNY had 7,508 full-time faculty members in 2016. Amongst its adjunct, that number totaled 12,562. 918 blacks or African Americans were counted amongst CUNY's full-time faculty, and 2018 were classified as part-time faculty members. Overall, African Americans or black constitute 12.3% of CUNY's 7,508 full-time professors. While some will argue that re this represents progress because the percentage of CUNY full-time professors reflect the percentage of blacks who make up the American population, I would counsel caution. Here is an important example of why we all should be cautious in forming false conclusions based on institutional data. CUNY full-time faculty members do not reflect the demographic reality of New York City or CUNY students. For example, New York City population is 44.6% white, 27.5% Hispanic, 25.1% black, and 11.8% Asian American. But overall, 60% of its full-time faculty members are white. Additionally, Hispanics and African Americans constitute 9% and 12.2% respectively of its full-time faculty members according to CUNY's Human, uh, Office of Human Resource Management. In the report I cited, from fall 2015 to fall 2016, CUNY hired approximately 244 new faculty members. Of that number, 21 were African Americans or black, and only one was hired in the category of area, ethnic, cultural, gender, and group studies. We must also be careful when utilizing CUNY data because at least in one case, I discovered a glaring mistake. This mistake was on page seven in table A3 of the Office of Human Resource Management Report. This table indicated that in the fall of 2016, Meadows College had only 36 full-time professors who were categorized as African-Americans or black, compared to 432 full-time white professors. Obviously, these data points should be closely studied to make sure that they are not misrepresented that they are not misrepres misrepresentative. We as concerned individuals and important voices in our community need to look more carefully at the hiring and recruitment practices of individual college and ask that CUNY Central provide guidelines and financial resources that will buttress strategic recruiting and hiring practice of qualified African Americans. These strategic and recruitment practices should be consistent with federal laws. Equally important, CUNY is not exempt from America's historical structures that perpetuate institutional racism. This is not to say that CUNY is a racist institution, but I, because I do not believe that to be so. However, it's meant to recognize that black faculty face many barriers to getting a full-time position, achieving tenure, and pro promotion. As a former chairperson of the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences, I've met many talented black scholars who could have added value to the institution and the students we serve. However, many of them had to depart because I could not offer them full-time positions. By way of a conclusion, the reality is that most institutions fund their strategic priorities. What is CUNY doing to adequately fund its diversity priorities? 
If we look at the resource CUNY's invested in transforming its faculty into a diverse group, reflecting the historical and cultural traditions of people living in New York, I think we I think it's safe to say that we have a long way to go. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the panel for your testimony. And you, it was very enlightening to me <laughs> that I had been making an assumption that was incorrect. So uh, Dr. Green, in your testimony, you made a statement which helped me to come to a better understanding because it says five senior colleges offer baccalaureate black studies degrees. And then later on in your testimony, you said City College does not have a black studies department. And it was very telling, wait a minute, programs and departments and degrees are all very distinct. So if you would elaborate on that for me, and I wish I had thought about that sooner because I would have made that more of an issue. So there are five schools that have degrees how many that have departments? Right. So um, there was discussion about what you need to constitute a department. Right. And this goes back, City College did have a department under the former, under not the former, when, when, Jeff, when Leonard Jeffries was, yes, was chair. Right. And after that, they um, dismantled the department in essence. So City College has a program and they the program offers the back the bachelor's degrees in black studies and the faculty are in uh, joint uh, joint um, they, they're, they're serving in two two areas so the the former um, Cheryl Sterling was chair of the black studies uh, black studies degree for the last five years she has just um, resigned and she is now at another college. And uh, she, she indicated that three faculty left. There are only two faculty left in that program and they all have joint appointments. So you have a situation where the uh, colleges uh, advocate for a department, but if the administration does not support a department, then they can offer a degree. I think New York City Tech was, is an example of that. They support the degree. No, they don't even have the degree. They have a minor. City College, New York City Tech, I'm sorry, has um, a concentration or a minor. So it was, it was enlightening to me also. <laughs> okay. Um, and, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Brown from Hunter College. Can you? Hit your button. It's a lot of feedback. Turn it off when we're not talking. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's feedback when they stay on. And, and I want to thank you for bringing this matter to my attention. It was about a year or so ago that you saw me on the train and said, oh, you know what? There's an issue. And that's the kind of input that we need, the kind of coattailing, you know, pulling on the coattails to bring a matter up so that we can have a forum and look at what the issues are and see, not just look at the issues and have people come, but what are we going to do about it? What kind of actions are we going to take and how are we going to make sure that uh, we have some kind of longitudinal accountability so that people don't just come and say, oh, we have this, this, what has been the impact and what has been the effect? Uh, Council Member Holden? Um, <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Anthony Brown, a great testimony, by the way, and all, uh, all the uh, testimony that you gave, the panel gave. Just a question on mentoring, which uh, re retention of uh, black faculty. Mm -hmm. um, do you, does the administration at Hunter support the mentoring program in your department? I, I would say it this way. Uh, certainly it encourages it, but what I think my colleagues and I are looking for is an institutional commitment to mentoring across the college. So it's not just based on, say, individual faculty members. There's a structure in place uh, that mandates uh, junior faculty be mentored and given the requisite resources uh, in order to at least promote their ability to do well uh, through the educational ranks. 
Uh, and so um, I think that's the key here, to have something CUNY-wide uh, that's in place, so faculty don't feel isolated uh, in their respective departments. And in part why I mentioned the issue of cluster hires, because you're essentially creating a community when you bring in, um, a, again, a cluster hire. And so you deal with support, uh, you deal with, uh, and you reduce questions of the validity of one's research, et cetera. Uh, one of the things that we know, um, both anecdotally and from research, is that oftentimes research done by black faculty uh, is, is marginalized by uh, peers of the larger community. Uh, and so uh, that can create um, severe uh, notions of isolation uh, by faculty and alienation. Uh, a colleague of mine um, refers to the notion of me-search, meaning that oftentimes uh, uh, black faculty who do research on race uh, is, is viewed as, again, them studying themselves, so therefore it doesn't have merit or validity uh, by, again, by more senior colleagues. And that is a major issue. So uh, trying to get at the heart of, of those kinds of cultural um, um, aspects that, again, denigrate uh, the work of, of these scholars is, is what I'm getting at. OK, thank you so much. I want to thank the panel for coming and sharing their testimony with us. Thank you. And we're now going to call the next panel, Professor Blake from BMCC, Jerome Brown from BMCC, and Dr. Valerie Small uh, from New York City. We're facing a dilemma. This is a really popular topic, and we've got three more panels, and we are scheduled to be out of here by one. So what we're going to do is ask each of the following panels to uh, make their mark, remarks as concise as possible. Okay, so again, please, in consideration of the 10 more people that we're going to have come up in their various panels, please uh, condense your remarks and make them as concise as possible. And I'm gonna ask counsel to administer the oath. Good afternoon, would you raise your right hands? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and respond honestly to council members' questions? Please state your names for the record. Yes, next. My name is Jerome Brown. Dr. Valerie Small. Okay, thank you. And your testimony, please. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank the councilwoman, uh, Ines Barron, for giving us an opportunity to talk about such an important topic as uh, black studies and the hiring of black faculty. I am president of the Black Faculty and Staff Association at the Borough of Manhattan Community College. Uh, and I'm going to kind of like abbreviate my comments in respect, you know, for the time. And I'll just simply say that uh, some things are the same and some things never change. Uh, I've been in this college for 48 years. And I can remember back in 1972 when myself and Professor John uh, Glenn and uh, Professor Sonia Sanchez was marched through the campus in handcuffs fighting for black studies. And we went to jail to get black studies. And we were not just fighting for black studies the fact of the matter is that the knowledge of self is so important for the growth of our children, the intellectual, emotional, and psychological well-being, that if we don't find a way in which to understand how important that is, then our communities continue to suffer. I was born in New York, never had a black teacher from the time I was in kindergarten all the way through high school. I didn't even know there were such things as black teachers until I was able to find out about black colleges. And I was so excited, I had a scholarship to NYU. I went to the committee and said, I don't want to go to NYU. They said, why? I said, I want to go to North Carolina College. He said, why do you want to go to South? I said, because I want to be around people who look like me and who have been achievers uh, in life. And I went there and it was the best thing I'd ever done. When I got out of uh, Columbia in 70, the student body was insisting on 
more black faculty members and more black studies. And we fought and we did uh, achieve quite a bit, but it was with the help of students and students being able to understand the importance of it. So what I want to say is three things, and it doesn't cover all of what I had to say, but three things. One thing that came out was I tried to get data on the number of adjuncts that were uh, a move to full-time positions in CUNY, throughout CUNY. Couldn't find the data anywhere. I was told by the institutional research person that we don't keep such data. So I would like the council to see if they can find a way to find out the programs that the president of one of the colleges talked about in terms of getting adjuncts into full-time positions. What happened to that program? What was the data? Did, is it still going on? That's very, very key. Because it's a very painful situation when you're an adjunct and you're in a uh, college for 10 years and 15 years and, and a full-time position comes available and somebody who doesn't look like you have been there maybe two years can get the position and you bypass. That's very painful, you know. So I, I would like to get that kind of data. I would also say, you know, at Borough Manhattan Community College, you know, we got to be very careful with definitions we're making progress, you know. You know, we're making progress. We have the science department at Borough Manhattan Community College that had that has something like, a f what, 50 uh, science department, have 58 full-time faculty, and none of them are black. And I met with the president yesterday. And she said, oh, no, Jim, we just hired one. <laughs> we're making progress. That's not progress, you know. You know, and you look at the modern language department, 27 faculty, none black. Compu computer science, 16 faculty, none black. Computer applications, again, 16 faculty, none black. Academic literacy and linguistics department, 38 full-time faculty, only three are black. And this department recently, in the last two years, hired eight new faculty members, none of them were black. That's so comfortable. Nobody's challenging that, you know? And, and, and I can tell you that in 48 years, I've been here before with the studies and the talk and how much we are interested in diversity. And 48 years later, I'm still here and we're still talking about the same thing. Councilman Holder said something very important. He said, where's the accountability? We've got to have action. You know, studying a problem doesn't mean you resolve the problem. Knowing doesn't lead to doing. You know, you have to do something about the problem after you study the problem. So I can go on and on, but I just want to thank you again and say that uh, when I leave, uh, I will be the only black male faculty counselor in the entire college. And I wish that we can get this problem solved because i like to retire. Bye. Uh, hello again. My name is Jerome Brown. I am uh, currently attending BMCC, where I will earn my associate's degree in English literature this December 2018. I'm also a published writer since attending BMCC, where I've maintained a GPA of 3.7 or better. Last semester, I was recognized on the uh, dean's list. I've tutored several students in English, uh, and um, I have a um, mentee that I was paired with uh, this semester. Um, lastly, I am uh, the president of the student-led uh, club on campus, the Honor Society of Black Students. I grew up under foster care in Mount Vernon, New York, where I attended Long, uh, Longfellow Elementary School and Mount Vernon uh, High School. By the time I entered the 11th grade, uh, I had been shuffled through the system, and my level of comprehension, particularly in math, was that of a fifth grader. Ultimately, I dropped out and managed to obtain a piece of paper called the GED, GED uh, which I define as uh, an acronym for a good education denied, claiming I was proficient in all subjects required. I showed little interest. Uh, uh, I showed little interest. I showed little interest in school uh, because little interest was paid to me. Um, most of the student population where I, uh, where I, in, in the schools that I went to uh, were black. Um, 
and all of my teachers, as Professor Blake uh, said, all of them were white uh, straight through um, uh, high school when I dropped out. Um, when I entered uh, BMCC uh, at the age of 50 in 2016, it was the first time that I re experienced uh, what I refer to as reflections of myself, black men in particular who were professors. Uh, it was mandatory that I take remedial math, uh, uh, remedial eight uh, math, uh, a basic comprehension level of math, uh, arithmetic, adding, subtracting, multiplication, and division. I thought nothing of it because I, uh, it had been 30 plus years since I had received a GED. But what I witnessed in class were students, teens, fresh out of high school, in the same situation that I was in, not prepared for college. college. By this time, I had conditioned myself to believe that I could not comprehend math and feared taking it. I sought counseling at BMCC because I felt defeated shortly after my ser first semester began. In passing, I met a reflection, uh, a black man, Professor uh, Blake, who he saw me. Um, he saw me. And um, He acknowledged, he, he saw me, he actually saw me before uh, I uh, saw him. I, uh, I was defiantly wearing a kufi when Professor Blake said, Salam Alaikum, my brother. I didn't know how to respond. I, I, in my defiance, I wasn't familiar with the language. I am not religious, I accept atheism. Uh, he extended his hand and proceeded, to cordial, and proceeded cordially. You know you're a target these days wearing a kufi, brother. I acknowledge that's exactly why I'm wearing it. Um, before moving on, he smiled and simply said, my office is down the hall, pass by any time, I'd like to hear from you. He saw me again. I knew he understood, understood my mental state, confused, angry, and fearful, neatly hidden behind a smile. I had been exposed and my ignorance was not judged. He understood my complexities as a black man. Within days, Within a day or so, I was in his office sobering over my fear of math. After I finished, he gave me the gift of confidence I had been lacking. He said, brother, you're a smart man. What you need is an intensive one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Professor Blake proceeded to escort me to a program on campus that he initiated, UMLA, which is an acronym for Urban Male Leadership Academy. I was immediately connected with the tutor mentee. I breezed through remedial math, math 56, and ultimately uh, statistics. I apologize for the oversight that should be statistics. Back to back. Uh, while in remedial math, I was pre presented with another reflection of myself. My professor, a black man, didn't just teach math. He was passionate, caring, and made math enjoyable. Um, I followed him uh, through statistics. I share my story only to say uh, there are far too many reflections of myself black men in particular who are visible role models uh, at a teaching level. I reveal nothing new by saying black men in particular are least likely to succeed academically. Had I not met Pes Professor Blake, I emphasize a black man within academia who saw me and embraced my complexities, there is a strong possibility uh, that I'll be just another statistic. Hi, I'm Dr. Valerie Small, and um, unlike all of those who preceded me, I do not, I, and I did not do any uh, specific research because I am the research data today. It's me. Um, I have not been structurally protected as um, 
maybe I should have been, and that's why we need to have something in place, as the former professor had just said. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I don't want to use the word victim, but I am a result of speaking out. And uh, I've been speaking out for about 30, 35 to 37 years because Dr. Lewin was my professor at the Baruch College. So it's very strange, and, and I sat there and I was crying when I heard you talking because this is what we was doing 37 years ago. And to say that I have graduated with a doctoral degree with three master's degrees and a bachelor's degree, I am still not qualified mm -hmm. to have a full-time position. Uh, so with that being said, at the age of 55 as an African-American uh, woman, uh, I've been an adjunct for close to 17 years, if not 17 years. I applied for several positions at uh, two community colleges, first starting with Queensboro Community College, and I was on, uh, they gave me, I believe, like three to five years to complete the degree, and uh, I did not complete it at that time, but I was promised a lecturer position if I did not get it, and then I could switch over. They denied that, and I had to start a fight with EEOC against them. When I started the fight, um, the white board told me, if you drop the charges against us, we will give you a position. And I said, I refuse to do that. So they said, you'd rather lose a job uh, as opposed, you rather uh, stand up for principle as opposed to have a job. I said, you're exactly right, because there's others that's coming behind me. So I'm here again today looking at the same situation at Borough Manhattan Community College. Again, they too, I went up for a position, just a subline had a uh, conversation with the chairperson over a year uh, about a subline, are there any available? And she told me no. The same semester she hired three white men who do not have doctoral degrees, and I don't even know if they have master's degrees. Mm -hmm. And when I voiced my concern, I was totally dismissed. I don't know if it's anger, disappointment, I'm frustrated, but something has to be done. I am even suffering retaliation to this point. I almost lost my home behind this with Queensboro Community College. I lost so many things because financially I was in stress and distress. And these individuals are still in these positions interviewing people that do not look like me and do not have my qualifications, and they are getting the jobs. I have had it. We have got to do something. I told a couple of colleagues yesterday, I have nothing to lose at this point. So they have my name, they know who I am, is nothing else, chairperson, that they can actually do to me because they have done all, everything already. I'm in, uh, my case right now with BMCC is at EEOC. Again, so with that being said, um, I just want to say that yes, I am a dis uh, statistic, and what they are actually saying is true, because I'm sitting here. I am a person that has experienced it. I don't know what else to do. They keep changing the game plans every time we achieve. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I have lots of comments, but in the interest of time, I will direct them to you personally afterwards. So I do want to thank you. I want to call the next panel. And the next panel is uh, John Adaramuf and Hercules Reed from CUNY USS, Liam Giordano from Baruch College USS, and oh, it's the same one. Just two. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to ask council to um, oh, administer the oath. And if you could please uh, summarize, there's a clock, please, two minutes or less. We've got about. Okay, please raise your right people. hand. 
Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm coming to you today as an alumni um, from New York City College of Technology where I had the privilege to study architectural technology. Uh, I currently serve as the legislative director for USS, um, and here's my story. I was a transfer student to CUNY um, from a historically black college, Delaware State University, where I was in a space where education, empowerment, and culture were in the DNA. Uh, being able to be educated, mentored, and supported by someone and people who looked like me gave me a level of support I took for granted. Seeing successful, seeing successful faculty administration and, and administrators of color gave me hope and pride. Most importantly, the only time I learned about hist uh, my history was not just an elective or the responsibility of the African American department. Transferring to CUNY was different. CUNY boasts to be the largest urban university, but they lack strongly when it comes to diversity. Student population is high in diversity, but faculty tells a different story. During my time at City Tech, I can use one hand to count how many faculty, let alone adjuncts, I encountered as a student in my own department. I was not lucky enough to be enrolled in their classes, but I knew they existed. I am extremely grateful for my education. Nonetheless, we are here about the elephant in the room. There was a CUNY task force that was assembled, and I would just like to read a quick ex excerpt from some of the um, statistics that we found. Um, faculty has gone up continuously over the years. Um, I believe from 2007 to 2006, it has gone up by 17.3%. Um, undergraduate numbers have went from 203,000 to 243,000, uh, a 19.6% increase. But we have to note that as far as diversity, um, approximately two thirds of the faculty continues to lack ethnic and di uh, racial diversity. Um, 7,698 full-time faculty members are white, um, with only 12% being black, 8.9 Hispanic. At the end of the day, students need, a city and need the city and the state to secure and commit to necessary funding to increase salaries and the number of full-time faculty. Um, I believe that is also because of the lack of funding for faculty that uh, black and brown faculty are also going other places instead of coming to CUNY to apply. Um, faculty need increased pay and they need to increase the number of full-time faculty teaching at CUNY. Um, my report says a whole lot more, my testimony, so I'll let you read that and I'll let them continue. Greetings Chairperson Barron, members of the New York City High Education Committee and distinguished guests. My name is John Adaromo. I'm the chairperson of the University Student Senate at CUNY. I'm also a member of the Board of Trustees at CUNY. Um, I, I, I needed my statement to include some other information, and I was going to skip over some of the things I typed out. Um, this is off the script. So black students at some of the, of the senior colleges, including Hunter College, have reduced have reduced in, in, the, in, in, the, in the past years as a resu result of the special scholarships provided by high schools. Um, for, for high schools around um, Hunter College. So these new students don't take classes such as African-American classes, and that has justified the trimming of the departments. We can fix this by desegregating the high schools, funding programs such as BMI in the same manner as those programs have been given funding, such dispropor disproportionately to other races, such as the Macaulay's Honors College. About two years ago, I brought this issue up to the of student diversity in the Senate Colleges with our current inter interim chancellor at a USS dinner. The absolute discomfort on her face and the manner in which she avoided me until she could no longer do so is still very clear in my mind. I know and I'm aware that students are very capable, capable of forcing the issue at hand. The current trustees at CUNY and I, as well as the student, uh, as the student trustee, ask these questions. But we also know that we have to do more than, more than just ask questions. In my time at CUNY, I've had two black professors at BMCC, one, one a math professor, that has been around for two decades and, and secured a tenure long before, um, long before changes like this were, were being ha happening. Um, and one at, at, um, at, BMC, at Hunter College, which fr was from the African American History um, Department. I will now skip to the final paragraph of my, um, not the final paragraph, the final paragraph of the first page. Adjuncts are the underpaid, overworked, undervalued members of the institution at CUNY. 
they were forced to take the burdens of advancing their classes. Um, while some community colleges have a notable amount of, of adjuncts, the senior colleges recruit graduate students at a dis disproportionate rate to community colleges in my experience. The use of adjuncts in this manner leaves it impossible for some of the other non-student adjuncts that might be able, that might be black to make progress in those senior colleges in terms of tenure and being a full-fledged member of the faculty. You combine that with the inadequate funding from the state for decades to our senior colleges, you find out that CUNY has not made any changes in increasing its faculty as a whole, not to even talk of the black, black um, professors. And as a whole, to match with its increasing population, um, give, given the fact that we now have a rise in technology and the demand of online classroom, I, sus I suspect the situation will get worse. In respect to black faculty in particular, the very best we own are approached by other universities and colleges around the country in a bid to improve their numbers as they can offer better salaries and conditions. To address the issue at CUNY, we'll have to adequately fund, CUNY would ha adequately be funded, will have to be adequately funded by the state in order to remove it from the regression it currently faces. We will need to reduce its rel reliance on adjuncts and student adjuncts and hire more black faculty from the numerous graduates, graduates it has produced. We will need to be the greatest urban university it claims to be in our stations, in our subway stations, and not look for sh shortcuts through online classes as a supposed future. They will need to be complemented but not replaced. It is pro proven that students do better when they have some, some, someone teaching them that looks like them. And if you understand the composition of uni, then this is self-explanatory. Thank you for listening and holding this hearing on this important matter. I hope that we have continuous conversations in this matter here at the city council and other places as well. Thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman Byron. My name is Liam Giordano, and I'm one of two. Uh, got it. Thank you. Is it, is it working? Okay. I'm one of two elected senators that's a delegate to the University Student Senate from Baruch College. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Dr. Lowen as being a representative from our college because, um, quite frankly, our faculty doesn't seem too interested in diversity on campus. So I'd like to begin my remarks. Um, so officially, my role includes representing all 500,000 plus students uh, within the CUNY system, just like John, the chairperson of, of our Senate, does as well. But I'd like to kind of withhold my remarks and, and, and solely represent Baruch College today. So this includes about 15,238 matriculated undergrad students and over 2,500 matriculated graduate students. I would like to address the issue directly. As a student who takes liberal arts courses and social science courses exclusively, and who is a senior completing the last year of a bachelor's degree, I can count on one hand the number of ethnically diverse professors that I have had. Within that number, there are zero black professors. I am testifying here today that to the best of my knowledge, this is an experience shared by a substantial number of my peers. I find this incredibly disappointing and unrepresentative of our diversity and its pool of qualified, educated individuals looking to teach for our city university. While on the topic of unrepresentative samples of diversity, I would like to discuss the curriculum at my college as well. This semester, undergraduate students at my <coughs> college have the opportunity to enroll in any of 10 listed courses offered under the subject Black Studies. Of these 10 courses, there were 15 slots available. This means some classes were offered at more than one time. Of these 15 slots, six were just the basic introductory course into black studies that fulfills a CUNY core requirement that students must take. Teaching the 15 slots are only eight professors, four of whom teach only one course in the subject. Of these 10 courses, six are combined section classes that share enrollment with another department. Five of these six are shared with the Latino Studies Department, which after discounting the aforementioned courses and professors, offers only two new professors. This semester, undergraduate students at my college have the opportunity to enroll in any variation of more than four dozen business-related courses that were taught by more than three dozen instructors. In my calculation, I only added the postings of economics, finance, and business administration subjects, courses, and professors let alone the many other business-related subjects like accounting, mathematics, and many others offered at Baruch. Baruch College offers no graduate-level courses pertaining to any black studies or Latino studies in any circumstance at all. While I understand my testimony can quickly be perceived as irrelevant as Baruch College is the business staple of the city university system and generates rankings and reputations to underwrite that, I would like to clarify my position. The City University of New York should uphold the principles that this city embodies and should be indicative of the values we hold ourselves to as New Yorkers. This should be translated into not only our student body, because we know it already is, but into 
the very lifeline of our education system into our educators. We live in very trying times where diversity and inclusion is threatened quite regularly and it is my recommendation that we offer students a well-rounded education to combat that growing threat. I recommend a more revamped hiring system that is more inclusive than ever before to offer our university students the just education that they deserve. Thank you for your time. Thank you. As I said previously, I do have comments, but in the interest of time, I'll reserve them and call the last panel. Uh, Kassan Cologne Manging, Ras Omiel Morgan, Hannah Hameen, Sean Best, and Najida Corral. Those persons are here, they will come forward. And And we're just going to ask that um, you just get right into your testimony. And as soon as you're seated, we can begin. We're going to dispense with the testimony. And if you could prepare yourselves to, no, we won't do the testimony. If you could prepare yourselves to condense your remarks to two minutes, that would be very helpful. You may begin. Yes. You can just begin with your testimony. Sure. Um, Give us your name and your comments. My name is Kason Colon Manjin. I'm a student at City College. Um, I say I'm a black studies major, but I guess I'm actually a Jewish, Puerto Rican, and black studies with a concentration in black studies. Um, but I'm actually going to take a, a, a folktale from a curriculum that I'm doing this semester from Zora Neale Hurston. And it's kind of contradictory to what is being taught um, through the departments. And it's called How to Write a Letter. I know another man with a daughter. The man sent his daughter off to school for seven years. Then she come home all finished up, so said to her, daughter, get your things, write me a letter to my brother. So she did. He says, head it up, and she done so. Now tell him, dear brother, our child is done, come home from school, and all finished up, and we is very proud of her. Then he asked the girl, is you got, is, is you got that? She told him, yeah. Now tell him some more. Our mule is dead, but I got another mule. And when I say clucking, the clucking sound, like, like African language, uh, the clucking sound was with his tongue and teeth, he moved from the word. Is you got that? He said to the girl, nah, nah, sir. She told him. He waited a while, asked her again, you got that down? I don't got that. Uh, you mean to tell me you went to school for seven years? You can't spell clucking sound? <laughs> Why, I could spell that myself. I ain't been to school a day in my life. Well, just say clucking sound. He'll know exactly what you mean. But for, for me, that, that really shows that we're going to, to college and it's not entirely culturally competent. And when we're leaving, um, we're, we're not rooted in our culture, our systems, and beliefs. And I, I think that we should have more faculty that are um, focusing on the linguistics of the African diaspora coming into CUNY. Thank you. Thank you. You may begin. Give us your name, please. Yes, blessed love. I am Ras Omil Morgan, and thank you, Honorable um, uh, Baron. Baron. Yes. Um, yes, I'm an alumni of CUNY Medgaivas College. I graduated June with a bachelor in public administration focused in criminal injustice or injustice. And Medga Evers is very important to us because of the seal of Medga. It has freedom, justice, knowledge, and peace. That is the seal that we want to promote. And Medga Evers does not have any Africana study, no black study at Medga Evers. How is that? All right. The police was calling on me at Medgar Evers College, and right now, because of that, I have CUNY within the Eastern Federal District Court as a pro se litigant. I wish to go to law school because I want to champion the power 
that has been instilling me at Medgar Evers from all of these great professors and administrators at Medgar Evers. I saw two of them earlier, Dr. Green, who I took, and the reality of enslavement and slavery not being even taught at Medgar Evers College is troubling. The police was called on me, an African male at Medgar, because I was promoting my First Amendment right to distribute books speaking about enslavement in America. And it's a blessing, because nothing is a curse. I turn it into a yearly commemoration of the 13th Amendment on December 6th. We all have to celebrate the 13th Amendment because it ended slavery, except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. So I am using that which has done to me. We have turned the bad into good. And Medgar work, we need CUNY to put more money into Medgar because to be the only predominantly black institution in CUNY and don't have Africana study, there is a problem. And because of that problem, we are here to solve them. So the Honorable um, B the Empress Baron for her <laughs> effort because I cannot just call her by city council because next year is 400 years, just five seconds. 400 years since 1619. We all should be commemorating it. HR 1242 passed, signed into law by the, this current president. Big him up for that. And to know that the Department of Interior has not done anything to execute on this promise okay. for for us. So again, I just thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Next panelist. Yeah. Give Hi. us your name. Hi, my name is Najita Carell. Uh, I'm from City College. I'm a Black Studies major where I'm a K scholar, Mellon May scholar, a Colin Powell fellow, or was a Colin Powell fellow, and um, I'm also in the Scattering Arts program. So according to a study by the Official Institute of Research in 2017, City College total enrollment rate for undergraduate black students was 18.9%, a 2% drop from 2015. According to the same study, only 12% of full-time faculty throughout the entire college are African American at City College. Um, of the 12%, only two make up the Black Studies program. This means the majority of students in the, black major, in the Black Studies major are being taught by adjunct professors who may or may not stay, and that disqualifies us from academic opportunities on campus that require us to uh, submit two to three letters of recommendations from tenured professors uh, of which we have a substantial relationship with. Um, I wasn't able to apply to a Stanford program because of this. Um, Beyond the immediate exclusion from certain academic opportunities, it is worth mentioning that not only the population of black students um, uh, and the retention rate has declined, in a study done by John Hopkins University, researchers have found by just having one black teacher, black students are more likely to graduate. In another study done by Iona College, the fact that black students, uh, the fact that black students fare better at universities when they see professors whom with they can identify was affirmed. In my own personal experiences, a major more, uh, motivating factor in my success as a young scholar at this institution has been due to African-American faculty at City College. Um, it wasn't the fellowships that target minority students, but rarely, if ever, involved black faculty. Um, and I also think that African-American studies should not just be a pit stop within larger department uh, because that's a, a form of minimization, which is also a form of erasure. Um, it should be its own department with the launcher students, which we currently do not have. It should have a director, which we currently do not have. It should pay the people who uphold the program livable wages, which it currently does not do. Uh, the fact that the program is merely a program and not a department, the fact that it's understaffed and underpaid, the fact that the office is the size of a closet shows me as a black student at City College that um, we don't matter. It shows, that it shows me that black faculty doesn't matter. Um, and I feel that if diversity in, in the student body really matters, and it's more than just an image of inclusion we seek to uphold, then so does African-American faculty and African-American students, and how can we call ourselves a minority serving institution when we're in a white hiring institution? Thank you. Greetings. Yes, yes. Um, I would just like to say Give us your I name, please, for the record. I am Hanan Hamid, but before I start, I would just like to request if I can just have the time so I can read my entire document. I came a very long way. I'm dealing with disability. I'm sitting here with these lights. I'm in extreme pain, dealing with lupus, and I have my and I would like to just read my entire um, presentation. It won't be very long. Okay. So thank you. Greetings. I am Hanan Hamin, Master of Science in Educational Leadership with an advanced certificate in school building leadership from Baruch College. A proud product of the public education system of New York City, including pre-K through 12, CUNY, and SUNY. Since 1981, starting at age two at the City College Child Development Center of New York, I attended eight public schools, 
three CUNY and one SUNY institution and earned two certifications, a dual bachelor's degrees, two master's degrees, and currently I'm in pursuit of a doctorate of education in curriculum instruction and assessment. And as a, as a gifted and talented student, my family searched for an intellectually challenging school with culturally responsive educators was extensive, difficult to navigate, and full of obstacles. As a doctoral student, currently doing research in education to combat this cultural disconnect in our public school system, I see the gaps in literature and practice that make negative ed educational experiences possible. As an educator with training and, cr and credentials to be a district leader and principal, I use the arts as a weapon of social justice to train educators, administrators, and students through my teaching methodology and curriculum to eliminate the occurrences that I experienced during my educational journey. I make this point to say that this void starts somewhere, excuse me, and carries over into any classroom. It is, a, it is imperative that instructors, including those in higher education, know their students, know their culture, history, and have a genuine respect for each child's right to learn and be who they are. Strongly put, the white experience is not the black experience. Many of my college professor associates constantly commiserate about the poor condition of their students and how much time they have to spend reteaching and in many instances teaching their students the basics before they can even start to teach their own subject at a higher level. They take the position that is, it is the fault of the students and their inadequate teachers in lower grades. They rarely question the whys. I do not think they ever take into consideration that many of their colleagues were lower grade teachers first, such as the teacher I had the misfortune of being subjected to. If the foundation is not laid correctly, the institution crumbles from within. The taxing educational journey I experienced included being bused from my predominantly African American neighborhood to schools in predominantly Italian American, Hispanic and African American, diverse European American, and Caribbean American neighborhoods. Armed with a strong sense of self from my home environment, each school I attended smacked me with indifference, lack, bullying, miseducation, microaggressions, and institutionalized racism in some way. The negative experiences I was subjected to was from teachers, students, and administrative staff. The epitome of that, re of that reality came to light during my high school years at the CUNY City College of New York Campus High School, A. Philip Randolph when a well-respected English teacher did everything she could to demean, degrade, and destroy the very existence of every child in her classroom. By attacking other cultures and, beme and bemoaning the fact that no other people on the planet suffered more than hers, the, the, her people, the Irish, and they, that they were the forgotten people, and any claims to the contrary were false. Not able to sit through the almost daily attacks when voice in disagreement, she placed me in the hallway more than once to the point where my parents, because of no assistance from insensitive administration, had to remove me from the school and place me in a specialized, alternative, innovative science school in Brooklyn, the Science Skills Center High School for Creative Arts and Technology. With the founding principal and staff who were culturally similar, relevant, and responsive, I was able to flourish as a student and individual. This growth led me to create programs at the school while a student, including the Joel Albilar Dance Company, featured in the PBS Emmy-nominated nom documentary, P.S. Dance, and began creating a business plan to open my own school. Revitalized with a love for education upon graduation from high school, I entered the CUNY system encouraged and ready to learn. Throughout this process of seeking an educational and culturally safe place to learn, my exposures to educators and professors who shared the same cultural black background as me or displayed respect for my culture was slim to none. On the CUNY level, I did not have any professors of color with melanin. With SUNY, I only had two. As a lover of learning, in spite of being raised by parents who are conscientious educators, this lack of diversity within CUNY faculty, especially in the STEM fields, was harmful to my development and detrimental to my educational career, causing me to drop out of college after two years. My yearning for and nature of being a lifelong learner sent me in a desperate search for culturally appropriate mentors who, who when found in the cultural arts community, later guided me back to higher education with the purpose after four years since leaving school. For these reasons, it is vital that there is an increased presence of black professors in CUNY and SUNY, and hiring should increase for this demographic. In conclusion, we must question the reason why there is a lack of black faculty so that the status quo, miseducation, and misrepresentation can cease to continue. That is my purpose in response to the question. What are your answers? Thank you, and thank you for the time. Thank you. Last but not least, 
afternoon. Good My afternoon. name is Sean Best, the interim university director for the CUNY Black Male Initiative. Thank you for having us, Chancellor, uh, Chair Barron, and also uh, all members and friends. Uh, so uh, I've had a lot of conversations with many of you about this issue before I've even come here today. So I know a lot of the issues have been addressed and have been already brought up, so I'm not going to reiterate a lot of those issues, but I will talk about some solutions that CUNY BMI is doing. Uh, number one, uh, we have started a doctoral network three years ago. Uh, when I came on board as associate director for CUNY BMI underneath the director of PhD, uh, Dr. Jermaine Wright, uh, who at the time was just pursuing his uh, doctorate at the point, we realized that we had to start creating a pipeline for opportunities for young black and Latino faculty, men and, and staff to become faculty down the road. So we started having a forum so we had a network so we can have a chance for people to interact with people who already perceived their and received their PhDs and their tertiary degrees to figure out what the road took to get to that point. And then also by therefore creating a network of people who are able to connect with each other and provide support throughout CUNY across different college campuses. Uh, also, we have the CUNY BMI conference that we do every year. As many of you know, it's happening at City Tech next Friday. Uh, I left some, I'm gonna leave some flyers here for everyone to be able to take one uh, and view it at the time you're available. It's a free conference and we're featuring amazing PhDs and faculty and speakers from across the country and also highlighting the work that our students are doing as well. One of the things we also started is also promoting uh, access and opportunity for some of our young people through uh, an intercollegiate council that we've now supported. Uh, Kaysan Kolomanjan, who's sitting here on a panel, is now our current president for that council, and we've created a cross-campus structure for all students across every BMI project, all 31 projects, to get together and talk about issues that are affecting us in our community, like issues of black and faculty being hired and retained at our institution. Uh, and trying to find out some practical solutions on how to do that, but also just getting the word out so we can get our students more engaged and active because their voices matter. And having more students uh, collected and those ideas uh, makes a difference for us. Also, you'll see in the testimony some of the results of what our BMI projects have done. Our students are outperforming CUNY generally in GPA and credit accumulation and retention rates. Uh, CUNY needs to put more money behind BMI because it's working. It's a model that we've done along with site visits to create a best practices document that has gone across to 2,500 recipients of universities across the country. We've replicated BMI in over 17 colleges and university systems across the country. And now COSA generally student affairs at, at CUNY is replicating what BMI has done, is now doing site visits and the quality control and best practices across their institutions. So uh, we're always leading the way. We get very little recognition for it, but we, we don't need the praise and credit. We just wanna see good work being done and replicated and also uh, just make sure that everyone knows that we're trying to create a pipeline in our own little way to make sure that there are faculty that are getting promoted and getting recognized in the institution. So thank you for your time. Uh, Thank you. I do want to apologize for the last panel uh, having you to consolidate your remarks, but I do appreciate all that you said and particularly want to thank you. I know that you had spoken to my staff earlier about getting accommodations because of your special needs. We do appreciate your coming. And I have to say that people can't talk about BMI without me acknowledging the fact that my <laughs> husband, my predecessor, Charles Barron, that's, that's right. right, was the one that was so much in the forefront and spearheading that BMI project. And it's been around since, uh, what is it, 12 years now? 13, 13 years now. 13 years yeah. now. So we certainly want to acknowledge his contributions. I want to thank all of you for coming. And we have to think of how we can follow up, get that forum and platform for how we can come together, have a concentration of all of our issues, and come up with a solution. And I sure. invite you all to be at that conference next Friday. Thank you so much. And this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.